My name is David Brown, and I'm uh, the third member of the Memorial Lecture Series Committee that you've uh, met today. You've already heard from Laura and from Gibb, and I also want to mention uh, Amanda Gilman, who has been focusing on working with the children of the parish uh, and giving them an opportunity to uh, do some do some work, hands-on work, uh, in this area and in this space while we're talking uh, here in the church. And it's just been great. We appreciate Amanda. As you can tell from both Laura and Gibbs' conversations, we have a, we have a terrific committee uh, that has been working hard on this uh, program for about a year and pulling it all together. And so we really appreciate, uh, I appreciate Gibb and Amanda and Laura's engagement in this. Uh, we heard this morning from Christopher and from Melanie as they spoke about rising to the challenge of faith um, and a food, the challenge of food injustice as people of faith. And now we're going to talk about this, um, how we rise to the challenge through changes in public policy. Uh, this is an appropriate topic anywhere, but it's especially appropriate here in our hometown of Washington, D.C. And so we are, we are delighted uh, to talk about that issue uh, today in the context of food injustice and what we can be doing. I know there's, you know, some, some people raise issues around whether communities of faith should have a role in public policy. Uh, and that's certainly questions that we all have to be mindful of. But I think as we look at the ways that uh, some of the most important advances in civil rights and social justice have been made over the past decades, a lot of that has been uh, certainly supported and often led by communities of faith and individuals of faith. So we really uh, think it's very important. And I think for a number of years, people of faith have, have talked and reminded Americans about Matthew 25, 35, um, when Jesus, who speaking about his coming back to earth, famously said, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. And of course, those who were listening to him said, when did we see you hungry? And Jesus responds, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So we are talking about hunger and issues of food injustice very much in the context of faith. And we've heard that uh, all morning from Christopher and Melanie. There's always a conversation to be had around the intersections of policy and faith. Um, we have three terrific experts here to talk about this today. And so I'm just very excited to hear their conversation. You're going to hear them talk. Um, I do want to remind you that you've got little cards at the end of your table, end of your pew. Write your questions on them and just raise, raise them up when you've got them. We have uh, two or three young runners down here who are just waiting. <laughs> they are waiting to come and get your question and bring it up here to me so, so I can ask those. And, and uh, when we get to the questions, just bring them on. We'll get to as many of them as we can. And those of you who are watching on the live stream, type your question into the chat box and Mary uh, Montenegro, who's running our live stream, will make sure that it gets down to us. Uh, so we can ask those questions as well. So I look think, forward to your. I think I just saw someone waving. No, that's not the plan no. anymore. Oh, we're not doing that. Oh, I'm sorry about that for those of you on the live stream. You're just going to have to. <laughs> you're going to have to send telepathically uh, your questions to those who are in the room, and maybe we'll ask those questions and, and get it. I'm sorry, I didn't get the memo. Um, in any event, thank you. Thank you again. The last thing I want to mention, we just had that wonderful lunch from Equinox Restaurant, and we actually have some extras. And they're out in the Narthex, which is the little space right outside the, the back of the church here, uh, in bags. So as you leave, feel free to pick one up and take it home and have it for dinner. Uh, it's, you, know, you can remember our day uh, even more fondly. So uh, our three panelists today come from really three different perspectives, but I think they can help us understand the scope of the challenges and ways we can engage globally, nationally, and locally on this issue. Um, I, I want to introduce you to Aisha Akhtar, Dr. Aisha Akhtar, uh, who's our, in the middle 
here. Aisha is a double board certified neurologist and preventive medicine public health specialist, co-founder and CEO of the Center for Contemporary Sciences. Um, and Aisha has, has written a wonderful book called Our Symphony with Animals on Health, Empathy, and Our Shared Destinies that combines medicine, social sciences, and stories to explore how deeply the well-being of humans and animals are intertwined. So, Aisha, we are delighted to have you with us today. Um, and Aisha brings a special expertise in public health and the dangers of factory farming to our discussion. So I think we'll, if you have questions around that, and certainly we have some for, uh, she'll, she'll have great perspective on that. Uh, next, at the far end of the table, I want to introduce you to Pam, Pamela Hess. Pam is the Executive Director of the Arcadia Center for Sustainable Food and Agriculture at Arcadia Farm on the historic grounds of Woodlawn Estate in Alexandria, Virginia. They have a four-acre demonstration farm and an educational children's garden to provide a sustainable model of agriculture to new farmers, students, and the public through hands-on community engagement. Now, Pam came to her position after a career as a national security journalist, and because of that, uh, she's led Arcadia into work with USDA and the Department of Defense to train veterans to be farmers, uh, to help fill the need uh, for new farmers in the United States. And she's also going to help us understand some of the barriers to food justice raised by local governments, because a lot of the work they're doing is in D.C. and Northern Virginia, and she can talk about that work. And finally, next to me is Danielle Nirenberg. Danny is a world-renowned researcher, speaker, and advocate on all issues relating to our food system and agriculture. Uh, in 2013, Danny, along with Bernard Pollock, co-founded Food Tank, which is a nonprofit organization focused on building a global community for safe, healthy, nourished eaters. Uh, food Tank, I love this, it's the think tank for food. Um, and, <laughs> It's a global convener, thought leadership organization. Uh, Danny's also the 2020 winner of the Julia Child Award, which I think is about the most amazing thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and uh, so it's just terrific. She's going to help us understand uh, the systems that drive food policy and food injustice. And one of the things Pam reminded me while she said, David, don't assume people know about the, the, the uh, food system. It's not something that many of us think about. And so I think we'll, as in our conversation today, we'll often be thinking about uh, those, those uh, food systems and how they, we can improve them. Um, I think Danny's gonna also talk about how Food Tank's work supports the five pillars that came from the 2022 White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. So I've asked each of our panelists to take approximately five minutes to introduce their work and to set the stage for our discussion. And then we're gonna begin with some q and I'll ask a couple, but I'm hoping you're gonna have questions up here for me very quickly that we can jump in on yours and we will get to as many of them as we can. Um, and uh, as soon as we have questions, I'll begin dealing with those. So I'm gonna ask uh, Aisha to go first and then followed by Pam and then Danny to just talk for a few minutes about the work that their organization does, um, especially in the area of policy, and maybe give us a teaser for something they want us to, to talk about a bit as we get into this conversation. Okay. So Aisha. Okay, thank you. Hello everyone, thank you so much for being here. So I thought I would just give you a quick overview of the journey of where I got to where I am and why I do the work I do in the way I do it. So when I was a kid, this is gonna be a doozy, I was sexually abused by an uncle for many years. And despite the abuse, I never said a word to anyone. At the time, uh, my grandparents had adopted a dog, Sylvester. He was the first animal I had ever known, and he quickly became my best friend. My grandparents lived next door. Sylvester was who I turned to during this time. Well, unfortunately, I came across one day, finding Sylvester was abused, physically abused, by yet another uncle. He was being slammed against the wall again and again. And that abuse continued for some time. And the funny thing is, is that as much as my abuse hurt me, his affected me even more so. And I think at some level as a child, I understood in, in a child's way that as powerless and vulnerable I was, Sylvester was even more so. 
Well, fortunately, my love and my empathy for Sylvester was so strong that that gave me the voice to stand up and speak out against his abuse that ended his abuse. And that gave me the courage to speak out and end my own abuse. And so I started to really see the true interconnection between the abuse of one and the abuse of another, empathy for one and empathy for another. And I really saw just how interrelated our well-being is with one another, as Reverend Carter was talking about earlier, with one another, with nature, and with other beings with whom we share this planet. So during the course of my professional career, I started to think about how does our relationships with animals affect our well-being from a health perspective. So if you think about public health, and the World Health Organization just described um, um, health as being a complete, um, and now I'm butchering the words, but it's basically a complete um, uh, something about <laughs> something about social, emotional, and physical health. It is a it is complete health in all all of those three sectors, right? So what we know in health, in human health, is that everything we do affects our health and well-being. So how we live, how we house ourselves, how we share our resources or don't share our resources, how we work how we use our land or don't use our land, how we relate to our land, how we eat, how we play. Everything we do impacts our health and well-being. Despite acknowledging that, public health has largely ignored one of the crucial influences our health to our health that has occurred since our very beginning, which is our relationship with other animals. And so let's just go back to this pandemic that we are now, on, thankfully, on the waning edge. Almost 8 million people died worldwide because of the pandemic, and that's just the numbers that we were able to count. Despite the good news that we are now ending this pandemic, the bad news is that we have not learned the lessons that the pandemic was there to teach us, which is this pandemic, in one way or another, stemmed from our exploitation of other animals. Whether it's from the wildlife trade, which the live markets in China is just one part of it. America is part of this larger wildlife trade. We're one of the biggest players in this trade. Whether it's because it came out of a laboratory in which animals were subjected to experimentation with the viruses. In one way or another, this pandemic stemmed from our exploitation of other animals. So what I do, I formed the Center for Contemporary Sciences, a new nonprofit, just as the pandemic was starting, which sounds like a weird time to be starting a new nonprofit. But what we do is we try to really show and educate people about that connection, that interconnection between our health and well-being and that with other animals. Whether we're talking about the use of animals in experimentation, believe it or not, it's not very effective for human health either. So we want to replace it with kinder methods that are also better for human health. We work on trying to showcase how factory farming is so detrimental for human health on a number of reasons. And one of the most significant connections between factory farming and human health that most people don't realize is the risk of pandemics. And we can talk about that a little bit further on in the conversation. I know a lot of people are more aware of the climate change, environmental destruction between with a link between factory farming, but not as aware about how likely the next pandemic will stem, will stem from a factory farm. So we work on multiple fronts to really look at this incredibly neglected issue that not only affects the well-being of the animals, not only affects the well-being of the planet, but affects all of our health and well-being today. Great. Thanks, Aisha. Yeah. Pam? Thank you. I love having to follow the genius neurologist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Pam Hess, and um, my story with the food system also comes from 
um, a previous part of my life before I joined um, as the executive director of Arcadia. As David mentioned, I was a national security journalist for almost 20 years. I covered the Pentagon, I covered the CIA, and I covered the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And if you recall, we're thankfully getting past that period of our history, but if you recall, the main visible injury of those wars were lower limb amputations from IEDs, improvised explosive devices that were in the roads or on the side of the roads and that would blow up from the ground. In fact, when I was in Iraq, um, I was advised to always sit with one foot in front of the other so that if something blew up, there was a chance that I wouldn't lose both legs. I would just lose one. So that's what I did. Um, I was very lucky and I was in and out five or six times. Um, but every time I came back, I was asked to go visit someone at Walter Reed. And so I would It'd be somebody's friend that was hurt and I would stop in and give them muffins or I shouldn't, I porn once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Wrapped in a Martha Stewart magazine. <laughs> Not as a, not as a regular thing, it was on a request-only basis. Um, <laughs> to serve the troops. So, um, so my uh, frame of reference for veterans was often lower limb amputations. Fast forward to 2013, I become the executive director of Arcadia, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a second. And we have mobile markets that serve neighborhoods in Washington, D.C., primarily in Ward 7 and Ward 8, that don't have grocery stores, that have um, low car ownership, so people are really limited in being able to get to where the grocery stores are, which is typically in the suburbs. Um, high use of SNAP or food stamps, and consequently, with all of those things, there's a marker of this, and there's a high rate of chronic disease. And so we have mobile markets that take a complete healthy diet into those neighborhoods, makes it really convenient and affordable and a joyful, beautiful um, transaction, and we're there every week and know our customers and we are their neighborhood market. So first time I went out in the mobile market in 2013, Ward 8, I saw a bunch of people missing lower limbs and I said to my staff, because I didn't know anything about my work at that time, it was like my first week, and I said, there's an awful lot of people missing lower limbs, I guess there's a lot of war veterans here. And they were like, what? You're kind of stupid. It is diabetes, I hear you there. So <laughs> let me just, and, and, and Danny, what's funny is 10 years ago is when I worked this out when I was first speaking at, at, a, at a food tank thing. So in the, United, in, in, in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, 20 years of war, very determined enemy trying to blow up Americans, there are about 2,000 lower limb amputations from IEDs. 20 years. In the United States, in any single year, there are 70,000 diabetic amputations. African Americans are 10 times as likely to suffer a diabetic amputation than, than a white American. And this is often posited as a problem with the healthcare system, but it's not, because diabetes is utterly controllable if people have access to actual food and not cheap processed food that is cheap at the point of sale and devastatingly expensive in terms of public health. So we are doing it to ourselves. What, what an enemy couldn't do to us, we do it to ourselves because we cannot be bothered to fix the food. We can't be bothered to make beautiful, healthy food affordable and convenient so that it's just an easy choice for people to make to incorporate into their diet. So it doesn't have to be something that they plan all month for to get to the grocery store to be able to buy a few apples and a, and, and a bunch of kale. So, so this is where Arcadia fits in. We are sort of food policy made tangible. Um, as David mentioned, we have a farm down on the grounds of Woodlawn, Pope Leahy. It is surrounded on three sides by Fort Belvoir. Um, we are growing on about four acres, mixed vegetables, about 50 different kinds. We have, an, we have an orchard, we're about to start a community farm, and then we have a children's educational farm as well so that kids can interact with food at its source and really build up their um, appetites for it. We have a 42.5% increase in the number of children who like beets after they come. Very proud of that. <laughs> so um, we are also, we train military veterans to be farmers. Um, we have identified partially because of my background, but lots of other reasons and surrounded by Fort Belvoir, um, we have identified that military veterans are particularly capable of being successful farmers if they have the interest and then if they have the appropriate training. And so that's what we do. Um, and then we have our mobile markets and our mobile markets take everything that we grow as a consequence of our veteran farmer training program and as a consequence of our children's programs. And we take that into neighborhoods in DC that I, that I mentioned already. And um, 
and, and we make that food affordable and available, sort of creating our own little food system. And, and when David and I were talking about the food system, I think that a lot of us really came face to face with it for the first time at the pandemic, when suddenly this incredible American machine of our grocery stores stuttered and failed, and we were waiting outside um, for food like we've seen you know, happening in other countries. And I think for a moment, the scales fell from our eyes and we realized exactly how vulnerable our food system is and therefore exactly how vulnerable we are. And we are still within that closing window of opportunity to make some real changes, to bring in resilience, to redefine what it is that food should be to us as a nation, but we are working against some very hard um, counter pressures. And there's just one thing that I wanna say right off the bat that it, I really want to talk food policy and I really want to see those changes, but at the moment I'm despairing of hope um, and I hope that things will shift. Uh, but right now it seems that we have a different kind of political argument going on and that there's a lot of people on Capitol Hill that want to make policy that will improve people's lives and then there are a lot of people on Capitol Hill that don't want to make any policy at all. They just want to win and they want power. And that is not an area that we can like sort of tinker in with like various food policy pieces. So I feel like we need to be talking about this and we need to have a plan and we need to be taking steps forward. But until this nation grapples with what's going on right now politically, where there is not even an agreement about what government is supposed to do for us, um, we aren't going to get very far. But once we settle that disagreement, and I hope it will be in 2024 when people show up and really demonstrate what it is they expect their government to be doing for them and with them and side by side with them, then maybe we can really dive into some of the details that we're going to get into today. But I feel like we're going to be, you know, whistling into the wind if we don't address that elephant in the room. Many metaphors. I'll stop talking. <laughs> Thank you, Pam, and we'll, we will come back to that question of, of our political uh, polarization, and um, I think we also have some examples from, uh, from our panelists of things that have worked in this, in, in this uh, environment, so we'll see, see where that goes. Um, so, Danny. Really, really hard uh, acts to follow. You know, the neurologist and then the former war correspondent who's this rock star uh, nonprofit leader. Um, it's no big deal. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It's, this is a wonderful space to have these conversations. Uh, so I, um, uh, again, am co-founder of an organization called Food Tank, and we have this very simple mission of highlighting stories of hope and success in, in food and agriculture systems across the globe, both domestically and internationally. And we do this with the intention to really inspire, motivate, and then hopefully activate positive transformation in how we produce and consume food. Uh, and, and, you know, I am usually on stages like this one as a moderator or MC. Um, I've had a really <laughs> extraordinary opportunity to travel the world interviewing hundreds and hundreds of of farmers and women's groups and, and youth advocates and scientists and researchers and policymakers and really just sort of collect their thoughts on what it will take to to change how how we look at, at, at our food systems how we look at the people involved in them and um, you know share those stories on, on food tanks platform um, and and doing that I think has given me this unique vantage point of sort of understanding what are some necessary components of how we, we change food systems. We've heard a lot about what it will take this morning. We need to respect and value people of color and, and the black and brown folks and indigenous folks who have uh, been and, you know, so, so abused and, and, and not respected. And their, their knowledge is, is integral to how we look at the future of food. We need to value women and youth in our food systems and, and uh, make sure that there are opportunities for them. We need to uh, understand uh, economic systems better and, and realize that true cost accounting in our food systems uh, are, are really valuable ways of understanding how, how costly our food system, our current one is, the, the, the current industrial food system is, and how 
how healthy a way of looking at the world can be if we have more regenerative food systems. So I hope we can dig into some of these today, but I'm really, I was excited to hear my, my pan, uh, co-panelists up here talk about, you know, what the pandemic taught us, what we can still learn from it, because I think that's necessary for the kind of transformation that Pamela talked about earlier, that, you know, if we're, we're, we need to learn from this moment. We have an opportunity, as she said, a moment in time right now to make the changes that are necessary, and, and I hope we can get there. I'm not as hopeless as Pam is. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks to all three of you. Um, we had a question from uh, the earlier conversation that I don't believe was asked, and I wanted to ask it because it really morphs into this question of policy, and I think each of our panelists will have a different perspective on this. So the, the question is, large farms were promoted as a way to provide sufficient food to feed an exploding global population. How do you believe we should, could continue to grow enough food to feed the world? So, Danny, I'm just going to start with you and we'll go down the table. Um, so, uh, I'm going to pull what Dr. Carter did this morning and, and sort of change the question, I think, a little <laughs> bit because I think, um, you know, that's not the, the question we need to be asking. I think, you know, large farms were developed, these large industrial uh, factory farms or confined animal feeding operations. Um, were developed, you know, during the Green Revolution uh, because we, we had new technologies that would make um, make doing things, you know, sort of uh, what was considered at that time more efficient. And what we've learned since then, what we've learned from the Green Revolution is these farms are, are not efficient. What we do know is that family farmers across the globe feed about 70% of, of the world's population. They are producing most of the food that, that people actually eat, the food that actually nourishes people. And if, if factory farms, you know, they're they're considered this efficient, cheap way of producing food. And again, if I go back to true cost accounting, if we took into account the real cost of how we produce animal protein here and across the globe in places you know, like China or uh, India or parts of sub-Saharan Africa now where factory farming has spread, we would not, these, these systems would not produce cheap food. The cost would be very high in terms of environmental costs, in terms of their, their costs on uh, our public health systems, the, the abuse of, of not only animals, but workers. So if, if we took all those things into account, you know, the meat that comes from factory farms would be very, very expensive. So I, I, I think we're not doing a good job at, at feeding the world, you know, right now, but the, if we remove these farms, we could be doing a better job. Oh, uh, <laughs> I'm just nodding like my head. I'm just like nodding my head. Yeah, that's a good answer. <laughs> um, I, I absolutely agree with everything that Danny just said, and I would also say that even if you were to look at factory farming on its own, what a lot of people don't realize is that most of the crops, most of our land use, land use by humans, is to grow crops, not to feed humans, but to feed the animals that we then use to feed humans. And that is an incredibly inefficient process. So think about all the environmental destruction that happens, the destruction of the rainforest, to grow crops, to feed animals, to feed us. Think of all the chemicals, the agrochemicals, the depletion of our soil, all of that. But also think about this. It takes, on average, about 10 pounds of plant protein, which is far healthier for each of us, to produce one pound of meat protein. That is incredibly inefficient. And we could, if we were to dismantle so many other problems, but we could conceivably feed so many more people without animal agriculture, without factory farming, with a more predominantly plant-based food system for everyone. So there's a, just enormous reasons why that um, there is such, so much misunderstanding about animal agriculture and the factory farm industry. But it is not the best way to feed the planet, is not the best way to feed us, not only, it's not only the best way to get the protein out there, it's not the healthiest way to feed us. And as Danny said, it doesn't even take into account all the other costs that are associated with it. And I will especially focus on the human health costs that come from this factory farming system, which includes not just the environmental and climate change issues, but also 
infectious diseases and the risk of future pandemics. Right. <sighs> <laughs> Here we go. So I want to give you a couple of tangible examples that will help you take some of this home. Number one. These giant grain corn farms, corn soybean rotations that aren't covered with cover crop, in the winter time, the soils blow off and fill the Mississippi River. Guess who pays to keep the Mississippi River clean, clear? It's us. We pay the Army Corps of Engineers to dredge that river so that other businesses can use that Mississippi River to move goods and services down. So we are paying because there are factory farms that are growing vast quantities of corn and not taking care of their soil and clogging up the river, and then you pay out of your tax dollars to clear that up. That's nuts. That's number one. Number two, when we talk about these um, giant factory farms, I think back to a story that was in the Washington Post in 2012. Um, it's pretty close to home. There, you know, out there, there's all the chicken farms, and you pass them if you ever go out to the beach and you see the smell and you don't want to go inside. Um, what happened in 2012 was this kid got drunk at a concert in like Salisbury, Maryland, somehow wandered onto a chicken farm and somehow turned off the power in the chicken houses. Within 15 minutes, the chickens that are like Tyson's and Purdue chickens, the chickens, the big fat chickens that you're buying at the store, within 15 minutes, those chickens started dying because they were smothered in the, the smell of their litter without having the power that was venting out their um, venting out their closed in barns. By morning, six hours later, 70,000 chickens were dead because this so-called, you know, factory farm that's supposed to be so efficient at producing proteins for the world to eat or even for just us to eat because I think Americans eat something like 9 billion whole chickens a year. So the system that's supposed to be so efficient for just one power outage, a farmer lost 70,000 chickens, right? This is carnage, it's immoral, but do you want to know what's even worse? It's not even good capitalism. That farmer was paid by his insurance company only $30,000 for 70,000 chickens. The chickens that you're paying nine and $10 for, and now even more in the grocery store, that farmer's getting about 30 cents per chicken. What's the rest of it going to? This is unbridled capitalism. This is not farmers making money by selling you food. This is somebody else is making money and it is not the farmer because the insurance company said those chickens were only worth 30 cents per. I have many, many other things to say. I do want to say this. So um, all of us, I'd say the average age in the room, we're, we're getting up there. Think back to our, when we were growing up. Sunday, you had a roast chicken. Saturday night, maybe if things were good, you had a steak for dinner and you shared it with your family and everybody got some slices. Then you had maybe meatloaf on Monday. Think of traditional cultures, like just go to Italy, spaghetti bolognese, one of the great dishes of the world, but that's like one pound of meat feeding an entire family of 10 or 14. Our factory farm, our factory farming of certainly of animal products, but of everything else, 95% of which is not food for the table, 95% of American agriculture is for stuff like corn and soy and cotton, um, and much of the corn is also going to ethanol. But the vast majority of the foods that we are now eating is being dictated by very greedy capitalists who have figured out a way to produce 70,000 chickens on one farm in 15 weeks and then sell them to us for $10 a pair, $10 a chicken, and, and pay that farmer only 30 cents per chicken. It's, it's criminal. And the reason that we're eating that way is because we have allowed this, the business systems that govern our agricultural system to, to set that up. So the reason that we used to only eat a chicken a week with our family and a big steak on Saturday and maybe meatloaf on Monday was because that stuff was actually expensive because you were buying it from farmers who were raising the animals and taking them to be processed and you were paying the true cost of food. The true cost of food, as Danny said, has been completely taken out of the equation. And this is now all about volume, 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 and cheapness. The American food culture, unfortunately, is one that prizes huge amounts of calories at very low prices. And as we see this Western diet expanding around the world, we see the health costs to it. I'll stop on here because I know I'm getting a little random, but in 2016, I had the honor of speaking at the Transforming Agriculture 
conference. It's the big USDA conference, and it's the one where they're like telling you about how many pork bellies are going to be produced and how many, you know, it's like from that old movie Trading Spaces. And so I sat through this economic forecast about the American agricultural system, and it was all about yields and profits and yields and profits and exports. And I waited and I waited and I waited, and there wasn't one single slide about American health. Our health is built on the food that we eat and the food that we have access to and the food that we can afford. And the entire USDA conference about agriculture, not one single slide was mentioned American human health. And this is where things have gotten so awry. We've built up these stovepipes between HHS and USDA. We are actively making people sick with the food system that we allow to prosper and then we try to heal them on the back end by all of us paying for Medicaid and Medicare and then outrageous healthcare prices. We have a system that's oriented, I think we're gonna talk about this a little later, oriented towards healing disease after it happens instead of pre preventing disease up front. And, and, and once again, I despair at unraveling it. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, Pam, we're <laughs> We're going to work on Pam's optimism Thank here as we, as we come along. Uh, could, would one of you uh, just give us a little bit of information about the uh, Senator Cory Booker's Farm System Reform Act? Um, you're, you're welcome to, if you, you want. You, you want me? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. So um, Senator Cory Booker and our, our organization is actually working with their office to help with this bill, had put forth um, a Farm System Reform Act. Um, and basically what it does is, if it were to pass, it would put a moratorium on factory farms in the U.S. and it would provide a fund to help transition um, factory farm workers to other forms of farming, including crop production. Now, if I wanted to put my negative hat and pessimistic hat like Pam here, I would say, unfortunately, this bill has a very low chance of actually passing because Agribusiness, the industries that maintain factory farming want to maintain the status quo and they have huge lobbying power on Capitol Hill. However, even if that does end up being the worst case scenario, the good thing, the positive spin on this, is we can really use this bill to much, much to more, uh, educate, I can't, can't even talk, to, uh, to further educate people on the link between factory farming and human health. And that's what we're trying to do as an organization. So you take something that may not have a good chance of passing, but try to use it in the most positive way you can. I would just add that while this legislation might not pass, it, I, I think there's a very important part of it, this need for a just transition. Yeah. It's very easy for us as non-farmers to blame farmers for you know, ruining the environment and ruining our public health and you know, contributing to poor diets around the world. And, and what we have to understand is that farmers around the world are often locked into systems that they can't get out of. It's a vicious cycle for them yeah. of factory farming because they have loans and credit and, and machinery all tied to the, this way of farming. So that, that need for a just transition, we, ha you know, we have to think about what that looks like. And it, it can be, you know, the private sector might have a role here. Uh, Food Tank uh, every year works with Nyman Ranch Pork Company in Iowa uh, to uh, be part of their, their hog farmer appreciation uh, dinner and, and weekend events. And um, Nyman Ranch is unique because they are working with 750 small family farmers, mostly in the Midwest, to raise pork on pasture outside and, and give farmers an the opportunity, if they want it, to get out of factory farming. They will help with that transition. They will help make sure that they are getting a good price for their pork because it's guaranteed. It's, it's you know, delicious. It's what people, you know, like Alice Waters, Chef Alice Waters wants to serve at her restaurant and other famous chefs. So having that, that you know, whether it's through legislation or a private sector component, to, to get out of that vicious cycle of factory farming is really, really important here. And we have to stop blaming farmers for this, not that we are on this panel, but I just, I, I see it out in the world where it's easy to blame individuals and not the system that really keeps them locked in place. Yes, yes, and, and 
as Ellis Water serves that beautiful pork and Nyman sells it and creates this, recreates a system that pre-existed where we are now, probably about 70 years ago. The reason that farmers now have to farm the way that they farm is because there used to be regional and local like meat slaughterhouses, meat processing places where you could take your chickens to go. There's one, I think, in Pennsylvania that's USDA inspected that serves all of the farmers who are doing sort of their own processing around here. So every, you have to make a, a, an appointment one year in advance in order to get your animals processed. That's how small farmers are trying to do it. But the big farms that you see, those chicken houses that you see in the Eastern Shore, they don't own those chickens. They're babysitting those chickens. The chickens get delivered to them as chicks. They raise them until they're about 12 or 13 weeks and then Tyson's or Purdue picks them up and Tyson's controls the final, the, the final destination of those chickens, the processing plant, the packaging plant, and the selling, and that's why the farmers get so little money. So as we think about this alternative and better food system, we also have to keep in mind that that's a really rarefied thing because that pork costs a great deal of money because that's actually what it costs to have pork like that. So in order for this system to be transformed and for it to actually work at a volume to really make a dent in animal welfare and in human health, we have to find a way to move resources into people's hands so that people can pay farmers the fair price for food. And then maybe it's time for a snap discussion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what, and, and I was going to segue to that. We had, a, we had a question or two, and I wanted to raise this as well. Uh, you know, we know one of the best ways to combat hunger and reduce child poverty is through things like school lunch programs and expanded anti-hunger efforts. Uh, such as SNAP and supplemental food programs. Um, famously, uh, Senator Bob Dole and Senator George McGovern worked together for decades on this issue. The two leaders of, of the opposing parties worked together and they, in, in the early 2000s, they won a, a, a food award together because of their work on a bipartisan nature to work through these issues and to support things like school lunches. Um, so I know that every one of, of our, our panelists works uh, with on the policy front and they're trying to put together uh, tools and messages um, to bring groups together in these in these conversations and, and I know um, Aisha's uh, might want to just throw in here when she talks about the FDA Modernization Act, which was a bipartisan bill, and I think, Danny, you had a, a good example of that as well. Um, so what are the, as, as people and communities of faith, what are the tools and messages that we should be thinking about that could actually have an impact on this, on this discussion, uh, and what should we be thinking about? Easy one for you. <laughs> I mean, I think what we've learned, all of us probably on this panel, is that collaboration is key and getting outside of your own silo and collaborating with others who don't agree with you. One of the things that I'm proudest of with Food Tank is that we often try to bring people in the room, you know, literally at summits and, and uh, on our podcast and, and other conversations who normally wouldn't talk to one another. And I think that's very important right now, despite the sort of lack of civility that we have right now in our political systems, I think we can need to continue talking to those who don't agree with us and that we can't be preaching to the choir. Sorry for my church. <laughs> um, but I, I, th I think that, you know, that is key for us to, all of us to sort of understand. But it's also having conversations like the ones you're having here today. This is very important because I, I, I can look out at this room and I know that all of you don't agree with what you've heard um, at least parts of today or, or from us on, on stage right now. And I think that's really important to, you know, open up churches and synagogues and, and mosques to conversations like this so that people can have that, that discourse that's really needed for transformative change. Great. Great. I, I would say that I don't even agree with myself 100% of the time. Right? <laughs> I, mean, I, look at, I look at what I said or did five years ago and I disagree with it. So yes, we're never all going to agree on the same thing, but we, there are some things that all of us can agree on. No matter who you are, where you are in your life, 
there is always something we're going to have in common with one another. And it's a matter of finding what that is that, that we have in common. And so if I wanted to go back to the FDA Modernization Act, so that was a bill. This is a little bit off topic, but going back to what another part of what my organization does. We know in my organization that now 90 to 95 percent of all drugs and vaccines that are found safe and effective in the animal tests end up being unsafe or ineffective in humans. 95 percent. This is a little known fact. Animal testing is very ineffective. Well, because you're studying the biology of a rat or a dog or a monkey, and there are a monkey and a dog and a rat and not a human being. So what my organization does is we help to replace the use of animal testing with methods that are kinder and actually based on human biology. So they'll be more effective in helping us find the treatments we need for the diseases we have, the diseases that we can, cannot prevent, for example. So we worked on a bill called the FDA Modernization Act 2.0, in which you had two opposing folks that would never agree on any other issue, but they came together to agree on this one bill. Rand Paul, Senator Rand Paul on one end, and then Senator Cory Booker on the other. If you know anything about them, you will know that they do not meet <laughs> on anything, except that they did on this one bill. And they did on this one bill, and what this bill is that uh, it allows, it expands the options that drug developers can use to go beyond animal testing and to start using more innovative, advanced methodologies that are actually based on human biology. Sounds like a no-brainer, right? Well, yes, you want to use the most advanced methods possible. Funny thing is, is Rand Paul and Cory Booker both came to this because they actually care about animals. They wanted to stop and end and reduce the suffering of animals in laboratories. So you can find common ground where you would never have thought of otherwise. And so when I think about, when we think about like factory farming, for example, and why even though I, I may be a little bit pessimistic about Cory Booker's bill in that regard, I am optimistic that at some point we'll find a way to get common ground. And here, one, one, whether it's because of animal protection or something else, one thing where there is common ground is I guarantee no one wants to go through a pandemic again. No one wants to go through one. And I promise you I'll tell you a little bit about how factory farms are connected to pan pandemics. So if I, you can just give me a few, uh, a sure. moment. Sure. So because of the crowding of animals in factory farms, they're densely crowded, right? Right now, there are about 8 billion people on this planet. We raise and kill almost 80 billion land animals for food at any given moment. 8 billion humans, 80 billion land animals just for food. So they are densely confined in factory farms or livestock, or, or, or I don't even know what the technical term is, feedlots for cows. And what that does, so if you think about a factory farm, you're closely packing animals by the thousands, sometimes hundred thousands, in a single building. And because of the incredible, horrible, miserable conditions they are forced to endure, their immune systems are down. And you know, if you're stressed, distressed for anything, it makes it much easier for you to catch a cold, right? Because our immune systems take a hit when we're stressed out. That's what happens to these animals in the farm. You add that factor that their immune systems are down, combined with the factor that they're so densely packed. Basically, a virus can enter a factory farm and spread from animal to animal like wildfire. And each time it, it infects another animal, it has an ability to mutate. We now know that we are seeing a mutation rate of the influenza virus, which well, I'm not talking about the cold, I'm talking about the kind that can cause a pandemic, happening in factory farms at a degree that we've never seen before the existence of factory farms. So now you know you guys are hearing about bird flus and swine flus running amok in factory farms. We've been very lucky so far because so far they haven't yet really been contagious among humans. But if you think about COVID-19, we had a lethality rate of two to three percent, meaning two to three percent on average of all people who contracted COVID-19 died. The worst avian influenza to come from a factory farm or to come from animal agriculture had a lethality rate of 60%. Six out of 10 people who contracted that bird flu died. 
we are setting ourselves up for a much worse pandemic because of factory farm. And it's just a matter of time that the next pandemic is not going to happen in because of the wildlife trade or even from a laboratory, but it's going to happen in our own backyards. It's going to come from a factory farm. So if we think about where we all have that common ground, no one wants to go through a pandemic again, whether we're talking about how it affected the economic sector, how it affected our job stability, how it affected our health, how it affected so many things, even just within this country. No one wants to go through that again. That's where we can find common ground on, in one way, on getting to the heart of factory farming and policy that can reduce factory farming. And on the, on the subject of common ground, I think before we can build any real numbers of people standing on the same side, we have to disabuse folks of what they think is true, because there's a whole lot of people who think a whole lot of things are true that are absolutely untrue. And one of the th ways that I see this is in the SNAP program, the, um, what we used to know as food stamps. Um, the history of the food stamp program, I think a lot of people think, oh, you know, it's like, it's from the Reagan era, right? It's the welfare queens who are having all the babies and then getting all the government money and living large. And this is not, this is not the SNAP program. The SNAP program began in, uh, right, right after the Dust Bowl, Farmers were hurting. It was we're coming out of the depression. People didn't have money to spend with farms It was a government aid program to farmers Let's put money in the hands of people so they can buy food from farmers so the farmers can economically recover That was one version of food stamps so Go go forward another like five or six years and now the new version comes in World War II is happening People are showing men are showing up to sign up for the war. They are malnourished. They cannot carry packs They are not healthy enough to become soldiers and we're in a world war, and the government's like, holy smokes, we better make sure that people have access to food. So they created what we, a closer version to what we now know as the food stamp program. Here are the facts. Most people who use food stamps are white. Most people who use food stamps have a child in the house, elderly in the house, or someone disabled in the house who cannot contribute to the, the family budget, and ergo, they need a little help with food. And most people who use food stamps are on and off in about nine months. These numbers might have changed a little bit in the pandemic because there was a, a whole lot more um, time and money, and we all know everything that happened in there. But we have, I think it's going to be very hard to sit across the table from somebody and say, hey, we should put more money into food stamps if they're still operating from this lie that this is about like poor people taking advantage of the government. No, this is a program that benefits American farmers, and this is a program that benefits the American economy. I think every dollar seventy that's spent on SNAP in SNAP. Or no, I'm sorry. Every dollar that's spent in SNAP results in a buck seventy in economic activity for all the small businesses and the grocery stores. The people that you will find arguing for SNAP hardest are the grocery manufacturers. And so, but to get there, we're going to have to confront a few things in this country, which I think we've been grappling with more lately. And one of the big ones is racism. There's a whole lot of people who see any kind of government help as being fundamentally something that they don't want to do because they think that they're being taken advantage of by someone else. And, and it's, it's all institutional racism. It has racked our nation. It has racked our food system since the founding of the republic. Our entire agricultural system finds its roots in slavery, in human rights abuse. It continues to this day. Before we can come to an agreement about what we need to do about food, I think we need to come to agreement on a few basic facts. And we need to strip the scales from people's eyes and help them see what reality actually is and how everyone benefits from programs that help people who are in particularly vulnerable situations at any given time. And I, I don't know if that was very eloquent, but we have a lot of talking and educating to do, I think, before we can bring a whole bunch of people on the other side of this issue a little bit closer to see that their own best interests are served by taking care of people who are temporarily or even permanently experiencing economic vulnerability. And it benefits the food system and it ultimately it can benefit the environment, it can benefit public health, and it's certainly good for our moral fiber, which I guess I should say here since we're in church and we've already <laughs> talked about corn. So. <laughs>
Um, is Impossible Burger the answer to our uh, to our uh, problem? Someone may want to describe what Impossible Burger is. Um, the Impossible Burger and, and Beyond Meat are alternative proteins that have been developed by um, the private sector with a lot of backing behind them. Um, I, I think that what how I would answer that question, I, no, I don't think it's the answer because it, it's just um, replacing meat with another ultra-processed food that is not necessarily good for, for people or, or for the planet, even though it's sort of um, lauded as that, that something, you know, this burger will be better for the environment. We don't really know that. I think what we need to focus on is making sure that people have access to healthy, delicious, because a lot of this is about joy, and I think we forget about that in these con con uh, conversations, that we need to provide people with delicious, healthy, affordable, accessible food. These are the, that's the, the component of any product I want out on the market, whether you know it happens to be a plant-based burger or not. We need more opportunities for the private sector in, to invest in, in, in whole foods, and in, in foods that actually nourish people. We, as Pam said earlier, we are very, very good at filling people up. We are not good at nourishing them, and we need to get back to nourishing people. Yeah. Aisha. From your public health standpoint. Yeah, from a public health standpoint. Yes. Well, uh, how do we how do we deal with a culture that promote promotes sugar, salt, and cheese as sort of <laughs> the default, um, you know, ingredient in every meal? Yeah, especially I, fast food. I, I would go back to the idea. So I think there was a question earlier um, in the conversation with Reverend Carter um, with um, about what what is it that we don't eat can't eat. And let's change that conversation to not what we don't eat or can't eat, but what we do eat and what we can eat. And so you turn it into a positive. I, I did not grow up vegan. I, my family background is Muslim, um, and they're not Hindus. We, we ate meat. My dad used to go and slaughter lambs during Eid, the celebration, and so on. But my family actually became vegan together. And so, you know, for me, I've been a vegan now for more than 30 years. And I don't see it as a deprivation. I don't see not eating cheese as a deprivation. What I do see is that the world of food has opened up to me. I have now been exploring all kinds of foods that I didn't before I became a vegan. I have such a larger palate now, better improved, refined palate now, because of this new world that I've opened myself up to. So we celebrate the food. I don't see it as a deprivation. I don't see myself denying myself something. I see myself as celebrating food, celebrating life, celebrating the planet, celebrating the interconnection we have with other animals on this planet, with one another, and actually enjoying the food that we do eat. So I think that's part of changing this. We gotta change how we think about food. It's not what we don't eat and can't eat, but what can we eat? And what do we eat that's actually something, part of a larger celebration? And, and a way to create that, um, that we've seen at Arcadia's mobile markets with data, which is very exciting, is that by making really gorgeous local food as good or better than anything you would get at the DuPont Circle Farmer's Market, affordable and regularly convenient, to the neighborhoods that we serve, <clears throat> there is, we have reported through surveys, a 51% increase in the number of family meals that are enjoyed together. And that is a direct result of having access to this beautiful food. When you go to the market that day and we've got asparagus fresh from the field, it's pretty easy to plan a family meal around that. It's a beautiful celebration. Having access creates the opportunity to expand your diet and improve the quality of your life. If you, you cannot ask people to expand their diet if nobody is, <laughs> if nobody's providing that food conveniently, affordably, with high quality on a regular basis. Like access to me is the very, very first thing. We often hear from folks that talk to us, that lots of like well-meaning middle-aged white women will say to me, like, do you teach people how to use this food? And like, A, the people that we serve have forgotten more about food than we'll ever know. And B, 
they don't need to be taught anything. Like, you can teach people all you want, how to make food, how to make food, but if you are not making sure that they have their hands on those ingredients, you can't, you're not changing anything. So I think we often put in these circles the cart before the horse. It's not about education. It's not about training people's palates. It's about giving them the opportunity to develop an appetite for these foods by making them beautiful and affordable and convenient and accessible all the time. Great. We are going to, um, we're going to work on Pam's optimism. Now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I'd love for each of you just to, as we sort of move towards the conclusion of this discussion to, to give one example from your experience, your organization's experience that can pr help us provide hope and optimism for the work that we're, that we're trying to do here and that we're talking about and the policy changes that are coming. So whoever wants to jump in first with that. I'll go oh, okay. surprise everyone with some <laughs> <laughs> um, Very quickly, in September of 2019, before we ever heard about the pandemic, um, I received a phone call. And it was from an Amish, or not an Amish farmer, it was a Mennonite farmer who was part of something that was called the Tuscarora Organic Cooperative. It was a cooperative of about 100 Amish farmers in, Sarah knows about this, in southern Pennsylvania. And, and for whatever reason, it was like a business reason, it didn't have anything, it was like a partnership reason, not like a lack of demand reason. Tuscarora Organic Cooperative, which was the main source of really high quality organic food going to places like Restaurant Nora and all the fancy places here in downtown, um, Tuscarora shut its doors. I think that the business partners had a falling out or something. And that left these hundred farmers high and dry because that was their way of accessing the markets in DC. And so this farmer called and said, hey, um, if we reform as a new cooperative, um, would Arcadia Mobile Market buy from us? And I said, yes, of course, because we had been buying from TOG all along because it was a really convenient place. 100 farmers means that there's more than one place that you can get spinach from at any given time. So it was just great to fill in the gaps of what we needed to buy. So I said, of course, I'd love to. And they said, well, that's great news. And this always makes me so proud that I cry. That's great news because it turns out that over the last 10 years, the Arcadia Mobile Market, which serves the lowest income people in Washington, D.C., was the single largest customer for those Amish farmers. And the reason that you all are now being served by Franklin Sustainable Farms, which is the new cooperative that replaced TOG, is because the lowest income people in Washington, D.C. love healthy, organic food and bought it in such large amounts at our mobile market that it enabled these farmers to come together and use us as an anchor client, get the financing that they needed, and now they are selling this food from north of Philadelphia, south of Richmond, out to Baltimore. In the circles that I run in, philanthropic, there's often this idea that the people who look like me and who have money are the ones who are providing you know, access to food, and I'm here to tell you it's exactly the opposite. The reason that we get to enjoy Franklin Sustainable Foods is because of that community, not because of this community. Pam, that's a great, that's a great kick optimistic. off to this question. So. <laughs> I sure, Danny. I don't have anything that exciting to say, <laughs> except I, I am hopeful because of the fact that when we talked about the FDA Modernization Act, of two total polar opposites coming together, it really gives me hope that we can find um, common ground with anyone, with anyone to make the changes that we want. And I'll just leave it at that. That's great. I, I agreed. Agreed. I have an example of another piece of legislation that I think it, it, you know, is, is heartening. It's the Food Donation Improvement Act, which built upon the Good Samaritan Act, which made it easier um, for you know, institutions like churches and, and others to uh, donate food. The Good Samaritan Act, though, had some issues with it. Um, and, you know, there was some legality issues around uh, food donation. So what happened um, over the last two and a half years is that the Healthy Living Coalition, which is ironically started by WW or Weight Watchers, as how many of you know them, um, because one person, one client of theirs, um, looked at you know how food donation was happening in his community, and he saw problems there. His name is Lou. He's from St. Louis, and he he you know he told the 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 leadership at WW about this. As a private sector you know, uh, entity, WW decided to start the Healthy Living Coalition, which is made up of 
um, different companies, nonprofits like the Food Recovery Network, um, which works uh, with college campuses across the United States to help students be leaders in, in helping rescue and donate food. Food Tank is part of it, other organizations, and, and you know, individuals who are, uh, uh, who are very excited about improving uh, food donation and, and making sure that you know, very valuable food doesn't go to waste, that it gets to people who want it and, and need it. And so it, you know, over the last two and a half years, we've, uh, the Healthy Living Coalition has been really uh, working hard and to get bipartisan support, and it did on Capitol Hill. People like the late Jackie Walorski, who was a Republican, and, and folks like uh, you know, food superhero Jim McGovern were behind this act, and it passed in, in December. Biden signed it into law, and it makes it so much easier for everyone to gain access to healthy, delicious food. And I think that's what it comes down to. We can have legislation that is bipartisan. I think food is one of those things where, you know, people of all sort of, you know, different sides of the aisle can really get around. And it's still one of those issues. I don't know how much longer it will be unless things, you know, uh, turn around in this country. But I think food and agriculture are spaces where we can still have civility. And I think it's really important to, to celebrate that. And again, I don't think we talk enough about joy in this movement, and we need to celebrate the wins. And of course, we need to, to understand the problems, the inherent problems in our food system, but we also need to celebrate these wins. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we're nearing the end, I'm going to give each of you just a couple of minutes, if you would, to sort of wrap up, give us any final thoughts that are on your mind, anything you want to say, plug your website at this point in time, um, and, um, and anything that was sparked by our conversation or the earlier one between Christopher and Melanie, anything that you want to chat about. And so, Danny, we'll just start with sure. you. Sure. I was really excited, and I had to write it down, about using places of worship, places of, of faith, as as an opportunity for celebrating, again, food sovereignty. I think, you know, churches and, and, and temples and synagogues can be really important places to to celebrate that and, and, and be examples to the communities and bring others into the fold. So that was really exciting to hear this morning between Dr. Carter and, and Reverend Melanie. Um, and, you know, I, I think, again, I want to go back to having opportunities like this to speak to to people I normally wouldn't get an opportunity to speak to. I think that's very important when we're talking about food and agriculture issues. So thank you for being open and welcoming. I am so excited to share the stage with these two women who are doing extraordinary work, and I hope um, that you support their organizations because they're, they're fundamental to transforming how we, we, we want the food system to look and how we, we want people to be respected in it. So thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> I echo everything Danny just said. I'm so grateful to ha be able to have a talk like this at a church. The last time I was able to, the only other time I was able to give any kind of talk was at a Unitarian church up in Frederick, Maryland, and I was so grateful for that. And I think these are great venues to really bring people into discussions that they normally would not have. And so thank you very much for setting up this discussion, this panel, this entire day. And I would also Can you guys hear me? Okay, okay. So there is a film, a documentary, that I really highly recommend you watch. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix is the executive producer, and it's directed by uh, uh, BAFTA award-winning director Alex Lockwood. But the movie, the documentary is called The End of Medicine. And it came out uh, 2021, 
documentary. You can get it on iTunes. You can get it on Amazon, which is one of the problems. Not Amazon. Amazon? Prime. Prime, yeah, which is one of the, the problems to the world, but we'll, <laughs> nevertheless, um, nevertheless, you can get it there in other places. But it really shows how animal agriculture is really tied into our pandemic risk and our risk for infectious diseases as well as um, the environmental destruction that comes with it. So I really highly recommend that film. If you can go out and screen it with your friends, have a watch party with your friends, other groups, The End of Medicine. Um, and then of course if you want to hear more about anything we do at our organization, we're the Center for Contemporary Sciences. We'd love to have anyone come and join us and help us in the work we do. I feel like I've fulminated plenty, um, and I don't really have anything fresh. I guess I want to leave with you, leave with you something that my staff often says, and that is like, food is the answer. What's the question? And take that home with you and and sit with it. Our, um, you can get in touch with me. Um, I'll give you my business card if you're interested. It's arcadiafood.org. And um, you'd be welcome to come down and check out the farm. Um, and, and, and so I just really appreciate this. And I think that there's also a really interesting aspect on the religion piece of this. As a person who's not currently practicing, I, I grew up Catholic. Um, and I'm watching what's happening around the country in various states and how people are weaponizing religion, weaponizing Christianity. Um, I think that there is a big discussion that needs to happen and good people like those who have gathered in this place need to be pushing back on the weaponization of what I was taught growing up was, you know, a, um, the idea of love and brotherhood. And that doesn't seem to be what's happening. Um, so I think you all have a really important role to play in perhaps changing the minds of cynics like me that um, religion is uh, a force for good in America and, um, and not something else, because I'm seeing an awful lot of evidence of something else. Well, I want to thank all three of our panelists. Um, it's interesting, Pam's, the, the farm where Pam works now, Arcadia, um, is on a, uh, what was a, an enslaved uh, farm, uh, one of George Washington's nieces um, at Woodlawn. And then the interesting story, the twist that comes into that story is in the 1850s, this is before the Civil War, a group of Quakers moved into that farm and they did not use enslaved labor, but they started farming the land and showing how it could be used and how it could be productive uh, with free labor. Um, they weren't real popular with their neighbors, uh, but in fact, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the really neat ties between Arcadia today is that tie back to using that particular piece of property in Northern Virginia to show how it can benefit people as opposed to oppress people uh, in, a, in, a great, in, a, in a great way. So Pam, thank you for what you do. Aisha, thank you so much for being with us. It's just wonderful to have your perspective. And, and Danny, thank you as well for bringing all of these different issues together through Food Tank. It's great, foodtank.org, is that right? dot com dot com good for you okay <laughs> foodtank.com um, so um, I encourage you to go on their websites for each of them look at the work they're doing uh, and and join in uh, where you find yourself uh, where where it's appropriate uh, this panel discussion will also be up on our St. Albans YouTube panel shortly at some point in the near future and so if you want to come back to these issues and, uh, and or share them with others, you can do that. Uh, we're going to take a short break. I don't think you want to go outside, but <laughs> I don't think you have to. Uh, we're back. There's coffee back in that, you know, take your right, take your left and go to uh, Nurse Hall. And there's coffee and, and hopefully there's a little bit few more of those snacks there. And we're going to return at 2.30 with our next panel, which is going to talk about eating rightfully. So uh, it's, we are really excited about that one coming up. But thank you all again. And thank you.
Fra Francis, can you hear me? Yes, got it, we got it. Ooh, sorry, that was loud.
I'm Sarah. Yes. Okay. We, okay. we, we met. On the thing is going okay yes. now. Yeah. I'm echoey. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. it's the. I'm loud. All right. <laughs> I'm like super freaking loud. Yeah. <laughs> no, no one is. No one is ever um, of their own volition. Can't be a microphone. Let me put it that way. Is you? So you don't mind me asking what your family is? Italian. Okay, I'll yeah, say, I'll, 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 I'll say, I'll say, she's either Greek or Italian. I don't yeah, know yeah, which one. There's no way she's at all right. I was like, I know, I know. I know. I know. Yeah. That's yeah, just, I, I think you're I'm an Italian from New York City. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, okay. That's my test. Much to my show. Oh, can you, I think, I'm right here, awkwardly. I don't know if it's a good habit or bad habit. Always, yeah, I'm always like, I'm always doing like death knocks. How about now? Can you? Yeah, oh, that's yeah. all right. That works. So why don't we? Oh, that's it? interesting. Let's put it to this side. But then what about them? Like the city inside. Okay. What is the food of your people? Yeah. Like that is real. So I think that's exactly what you're saying. I checked out your website after the call. You have a. Hello. Yes, that worked. No, you don't really. Got it. True. Okay. Hi. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for returning for our final panel. This is the brass tacks of it all. How do we, I know, so exciting, right? How to eat rightfully. Uh, I am beyond thrilled, beyond privileged. If it's not evident, I really am. This, this, this has been a remarkable day. It has been absolutely a revelation for me, and I am super excited to welcome this wonderful panel of, of folks uh, on this, uh, this, this final event of the day. Um, a couple of things just to remind you, we have wonderful lunches still in the back. Please take one as you go. Uh, and also, just another reminder, we have question pads in the pews. Feel free to ask questions throughout and we'll um, you know, frankly, I don't see our middle school. Aha! We have a honorary middle school student, uh, Laura Ingersoll, who will be running up the questions. I, I think the cookies in the end have done our middle schoolers in. <laughs> so, uh, without further ado, let me uh, introduce this wonderful panel. Uh, first, I have a, my great privilege to introduce to you, most of you already know her, Mary Beth Albright, who is one of our wonderful parishioners here at St. Albans. Um, Mary Beth is, yes, yes, indeed, 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 indeed. Woo! Here for the real Jesus, for the Jesus movement. That's right, the Jesus movement. Thank you, Bishop Curry. Um, St. Albans, she's a St. Albans parishioner. She's a food expert with broad experience. Um, she was a finalist in the Food Networks and a Food Network star. Uh, she is a writer. She is a journalist. Um, she has just published a remarkable book. It's in the back. I think we still have some in the. Oh, we are out. I'm sorry. I'll have to go to politics and prose. There's no reason for me to be here. Right, exactly. All right, that's it. You can't have this copy. This one's mine, but this is what you're looking for right now. It's called Eat and Flourish. It's a remarkable book about how eating uh, interfaces with our wellness, our mental wellness and our mental well-being. Fabulous book. Uh, Chef Todd Gray is here. His wife, unfortunately, couldn't join us. Uh, Ellen Gray, I had a wonderful conversation with her uh, a couple days ago, and she's absolutely missed, but we're excited to have you. Thank you so much. Um, they are Washington natives who co-founded their award-winning D.C. restaurant, Equinox, who fed us all today. <laughs> Equinox uh, was founded in 1999, and it showcases innovative interpretations of classic American cooking that is plant-forward um, with an unyielding commitment to sustainability. Uh, they are DC's leading advocates for sustainable agriculture and fisheries and for humanely raising animals. 
Uh, as part of for, uh, First Lady Michelle Obama's Chef's Move to Schools program, they were recognized by the White House for their dedication to promoting healthy lifestyles uh, for elementary students and their families. Their, book, their cookbook, The New Jewish Table, uh, published in 2013, uh, tells how they partnered to create new and meaningful family traditions. Thank, thank you and welcome so much. Uh, thank you for coming, Chef. Um, I have to say, so, so Danny was at the last panel was talking about what sparks joy in our eating. L let me tell you what sparks joy for me. I went to Whole Foods and I was running out of time. I had to get, a, I had to, get to a meeting. And the only thing I could grab was the beet gazpacho from Supergirl. And it was, again, a revelation to me. I could not believe the vegetables could taste this good. So uh, talking about sparking joy, we are so, so pleased to have Sarah Pullen. She is a former stand-up comic, which is super exciting, who in 2008 declared war on the corrupt food system by founding the plant-based soup-making company Supergirl with her mom, Marilyn. Uh, their source, uh, they source their ingredients seasonally from local farms to produce a wide variety of healthy, kosher, all natural vegan soups that are now available in stores around the country, uh, including plenty in every pretty much grocery store in Washington, DC. Supergirl is the first consumer packaged good brand to partner with the Fair Food Program, a groundbreaking social responsibility program created by the coalition of, and I'm gonna tor torture this, in Malky? Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm telling, I'm the rookie here, right? I'm the, I'm the one I need help. Uh, to combat farm worker exploitation. Committed to working with their neighbors to fight food insecurity, Supergirl team has joined with partners such as the DC Food Project, Yad Yahua, Huda, World Central Kitchen, and the Food Rescue US to work towards ending, ending hunger. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. And the Reverend Der Derek Weston, who hails from my heart city, Baltimore, uh, is an ordained minister with the Presbyterian Church, is, a theological, is the Theological Education and Training Coordinator for Creation Justice Ministries, um, uh, and represent, which represents the creation care and environmental justice policies of major Christian denominations throughout the US. He is a writer, a filmmaker, a podcaster, an amazing podcaster. If you've not checked out his podcast, Faith in Food, do that right after this event. It's, it, it, again, another revelation speaker, educator, and has most recently focused on the intersection of food and faith. He is co-host, as I just said, the Food and Faith podcast, and the producer of Spoon, Spade, and Soul, a podcast highlighting food and land-based ministries in the Episcopal Church. He also produced the short film series, A Wilderness Like Eden, highlighting the work of churches engaged in food justice work. After two decades, as a pastor and a community organizer, Derek strongly believes in the potential of local congregations, friends, that's us, to enact change in their communities. He has a BA in film studies from the University of Pittsburgh, a master's in divinity from San Francisco Theological Seminary, and a cert certification in health ministry from Wesleyan Theological Seminary. He is the co-author, big news, of a forthcoming book, The Just Kitchen, Invitations to Sustainability, cooking, connection, and celebration. So we are so delighted to have you too, Reverend Weston. Thank you so much for joining us. And without further ado, I am very happy to hand things over to Mary Beth. Thanks, good afternoon. Oh, sorry? Oh gosh, and Christopher Carter is right here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Run through things the way it's supposed to go in your head, and then and then you then you can't do the improv. So. I, didn't, you know, I didn't think you needed to do it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our amazing keynote, Dr. Carter. I'm particularly grateful to Dr. Carter for doing this panel because it was we we, we were talking about. You want me to use the mic? Okay. I don't know. They told me not to, but now no. Okay. Um, I love doing this panel because we've all been sitting here hearing these ideas that are really are, are pretty mind-blowing when you think about something that we do every single day, several times a day. Um, but this panel is about bringing it down and closing that gap, what Dr. Carter was talking about, the gap between um, what, we, what we know is rightful 
and what we actually do. And we're human, it's, it, the, the gap is always gonna be there. You know, None of us are ever gonna be perfect. But how do we try to take everything we've learned today and put it into practice? And I will say that my child has been fed by Todd Gray and Sarah and <laughs> Pam around here. He went to Arcadia's farm. So, um, so very much uh, part, of the, part of the community here. I'm going to start just by asking everyone, because this was something that Dr. Carter talked about in his keynote, um, about his food origin story. And I love thinking about it as an origin story, because it feels like a superhero, like Marvel thing. Like, what's your <laughs> origin story? How did you take this amazing intellect and devote it to food, you know? Because um, really, you can do anything. You have a choice of what to devote your life to. And Dr. Carter and everybody else on our panel has chosen to devote their intellect to food and their, and their life's work. So I'd love to hear, we, we heard from Dr. Carter, but if you, could, if you could bring it back around again, talk about your food origin story, why you're involved in food, and if you can, connect it to the kind of work that you are doing today so that you can introduce your work to everybody who's here and listening. And, and let's have a conversation. I mean, it doesn't have to be like one of those dances where somebody gets in the middle and it's like, <laughs> and then they jump out and then somebody else gets in. It's like, so, so, you know, feel free to interrupt each other and everything. Todd, you go first. Should I take it on this end? Can you hear me okay out there? Well, um, I grew up in uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, I think for myself, um, I think, you know, when I grew up in my home, my mom was a working nurse and my dad was a physician and their lives were spent in hospitals mm -hmm. and uh, but it was it was it, dinner at home was something that was never missed and it was always something that was um, skateboarding was never allowed during dinner time and phones were not allowed the phone if it rang you never picked it up and I think at that early age I think that I have got a sense of how important it is with family and food um, and I remember growing up and even my father using the term breaking bread when I'd had tough moments as a teenager and he said, you know, we need to break bread together and let's talk about everything from father to son. And I think that food became a big part of my life in a family sense early on. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, uh, I, I know that I, when I was younger, I never, I wasn't nine peeling potatoes in the south of France, and uh, <laughs> I don't have an, I, I wasn't cooking paella at six and everything else, you know? I was playing football and skateboarding and doing normal things that American children do. But I think um, I, when I was in college, I, I think I found the love of what food and restaurants do for people. And I knew that I wanted to own a restaurant before I knew I wanted to be a chef because I was so turned on by what the interaction that happens in a social atmosphere with food and beverage and people and, and the magic that happens with people over food. And um, that's where my love came for, uh, for cooking and ultimately led to uh, uh, opening a restaurant with my wife of 28 years. Today is our 28th anniversary. Wow. Oh. Shouldn't you be somewhere else? Uh, yeah, no, you know, we are, we're those kind of people. We got married on Earth Day, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but, um, you know, I, I feel that food for me is, it's, it's, you know, for 35 plus years in Washington cooking, you know, you evolve and your, your, what is important to you and cooking is still, I still have cuts on my hands every day and I still work in the kitchen every day, but, as we've, our business has grown over uh, almost three decades now, um, what's important, and not, it just goes beyond cooking, but the people that you raise in your restaurant and the people that you touch and the people that you provide for and the sacrifices they make for you are the things that I feel are what we give to our, to our city and we give to our, um, our community by providing long-term employment. And it's, it's really not, you know, people like to tell me, what, what does sustainability mean to you? Well, I think that, you know, watching a young bus boy get married and have children and have his children eventually be your dishwashers. And I mean, I feel that is, <laughs> that is sustainable to me. That's what sustainability mm. is. Mm. And, but as we've, as we've grown uh, mature in our, in our years as restaurateurs, I think, you know, we've 
we found that um, you know plant forward has been big for us, but also going beyond and, and we are you know one of the few restaurants that are really actively composting and making our own soil now and you realize how deep you can go sometimes without it's not it's just not using a saute pan anymore you're kind of doing a whole lot more and it just sort of reaches out to a lot more people and now you're you're involving and we've always been involved with our local farms and supporting our local you know our we'd rather buy from our local community and support our local you know growers and their families and again another little angle of sustainability there but um, that's sort of my turn on story with food and and, and it continues to to I say develop or it continues to, continues to be our focus, I mean, it, I think your focus is always moving in, in different directions, right? And uh, you always have your foundation, but um, that's what's brought me here today, and I'm, I'm honored to be here with you all, and, and happy to talk about what I do and, and be part of this, and thank you all for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. And, I, and I will brag about Equinox, that you really were one of the first, one of the pioneers in the Washington, D.C. area to do farm to table yes. cuisine. I mean, in, in before anybody, before that was a thing, um, and you were really invested in the community around here. So I, I, I do want to brag on you, because he didn't say that about himself, so I'm going to say <laughs> that about him. Derek, tell us about your food origin story. So yeah. Here, um, so I guess like a lot of good stories, mine starts in a garden. Um, the first job I ever had was watering my grandfather's backyard garden for 10 cents. Um, I was like four or five. 10 cents went a long way. Uh, it was the 80s and I was five. Um, and I think about gardening has kind of like been on a periphery of my life for, for a lot of it. And I always kind of had an interest in having, you know, little, little plots of garden, little container gardens and things like that. Um, fast forward to 2015, uh, I went through a really dark period of my life, um, going through a divorce, going through a lot of um, uh, career upheaval and things of that nature, and, and I moved out to Baltimore, and one of the places of solace for me was my garden, and it became this very therapeutic thing for me. But if you get serious about gardening like once you're I'm, I'm the kind of person who like once i start to do something i get kind of obsessive about it and i read a lot about it and i i get sucked in um, and gardening became one of those things for me and um, a book came into my life around that period called the color of food by natasha bowens and, a, and it's a beautiful photo journal of people of color um, talking about the ways that, you know, acknowledging the historic trauma that people of color have experienced in the land and these wonderful stories of people of color finding healing by going back to the land. Uh, it's a wonderful book, can't recommend it enough. And a light bulb moment happened for me um, around this time that every justice issue that I cared deeply about had a food component. Whether we're talking about race, whether we're talking about the environment, and even if you, if you trace some of our um, histories of misogyny and heteronormativity, so many of those things had to do with being able to track a lineage of who owns land and things like that. So um, recognizing this, I then started meeting a whole lot of people of faith who were having these conversations. I went to Farminary, where uh, Dr. Carter mentioned that, and I met a lot of great people. Um, when you get to a place and like you start having these really exciting conversations about compost, you realize you're you're like with the right group of people, right? I'm like, yes, compost. Um, so that was, that was my conversation with Nate, who is the, the director at Farminary. Um, from that, I, I, I went to, I, I got chosen to be a part of a fellowship, uh, part of Wake Forest Divinity um, for food and um, health and ecology. And that's actually where I heard Dr. Carter speak the first time. Um, and I had pages and pa I just found a notebook a couple weeks ago. I have pages and pages of notes from the first time I heard Dr. Carter speak. But I found this other note, as I was going through that notebook, I found this other thing that I had written down 
and circled and put a whole bunch of exclamation points. Um, Fred Bonson, the man who had coordinated that uh, gathering, said this, this movement in terms of people who are doing uh, food-based ministries, food-based um, church work, he said this movement is highly undocumented. And I don't, know, I don't know why that grabbed my attention then, but then from that comes the opportunity to then do the Food and Faith podcast. Um, a, couple, a year into doing the Food and Faith podcast, it dawns on me, um, God kind of reminds me that, uh, hey, idiot, you went to film school. Um, and so um, start working on this documentary project. The first, the first episode, which is out, you can find on YouTube. The second episode we're working on now, which is strictly focused, it's going to be a feature-length um, documentary on the Black Church Food Security Network, which is started in Baltimore and has really exploded all over the country. Um, and then being able to write the book. Um, and so I'm currently working at Creation Justice Ministries, and, and one of the things that has excited me is Creation Justice, when I, I knew the executive director, I'd already been doing this work around food and faith, and I reached out to him and I said, you know, I'm, I'm freelancing and I'm really enjoying making my own schedule, even though I'm not making a ton of money right now, but I like making my own schedule. Um, if I come to work with you, can I keep doing some of the food and faith stuff that I've been doing? And he was super excited, like, yes, this is, this is the connection point that we need to make. And in fact, the Creation Justice Ministry Earth Day resource, which you can find on our website now, is completely about food. So um, that's, that's really where it's come from. It, it's, the, it's been about finding healing in the soil and helping other people find healing in the soil. Thank you, Dad. And I think what your career and your trajectory says to me, too, is about how anybody from any walk of life can get involved in some way in a, in a social justice movement about food. Absolutely. Anyone. Absolutely. For, no matter what you do, it's, it touches food. Yeah. Sarah, thank hi. You. Hi, thank you. That was, that was the thing. And happy anniversary, Chef. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so my origin story, I think, is constantly evolving, and so I think it's important that I, that I state that because the beliefs and foundations upon which I founded this business have changed drastically. Um, but back in 2008, I, I was going through a rough time, and I think it's important, you know, when you're going through a rough time to remember you're going to get through it and hopefully something good will come of it. So I was kind of searching and lost, and I also had the opportunity to read a book about the food movement. and. Are y'all familiar with Michael Pollan? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the omnivore dilemma. I, I was one of those people who thought that um, farmers markets were cute, you know, and, and, and adorable, but I didn't understand the impact, you know, of our food choices on the, the, the world. And, and so, and, and another thing that happened was, so I knew I wanted to start a business and I knew I wanted to get involved in food. And a friend of mine said, what about soup your mom makes? really good soup. And as Liz mentioned, I was a former stand-up comedian, and contrary to popular opinion, um, stand-up comedy is not an uh, incredibly lucrative business. <laughs> um, <laughs> so my mom used to come up like every six months to New York with a cooler full of soup, and I would put it in the freezer, um, and I would defrost it. So I have no idea what other people eat. I've been eating soup for like 30 years. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, <laughs> Um, but I do believe it is the perfect food, uh, and, and it, it can provide fiber and hydration, but also it is a way to showcase um, our region's amazing uh, produce. Um, and, but as I've evolved, I've started learning about, I would say, the story of the journey of our food to our table is not just. I used to think that all solutions were local, and I now understand that's just one piece. Uh, local food is incredibly important. But as we're trying to change food on a major scale, we need to think bigger. And um, I do believe, I know Pamela talked about capitalism and the ills, um, but we live in a capitalist society. 
And I truly believe that if we're going to make change, the business world can lead the way and consumers with their dollar can lead the way. And I have witnessed so much change since I started this business back, since my mom and I, sorry, started this business back in 2008. I've seen extraordinary change. The fact that we're we were talking on this panel about, uh, or the previous panel about the Impossible Burger, that, that, that's the Possible Burger, you, you go into- <laughs> <laughs> Comedian. I'm just joking. I'm not Who is the comedian? I know, I know. Oh, I said the Impossible Burger was impossible. The idea of it the was idea of impossible. It. And now you can go into a, bur a Burger King and get a vegan burger. Whether you believe it's the right thing or not, that's, that's, that came from capitalism. And so if we can get the business community and the consumers to really make the connection between our food choices and the impact, which is what we've been talking about all day, that's how I believe we're gonna move, we're gonna move the needle. And so when I say my origin story has changed, Michael Pollan in that book really focused on local and I'm focusing on big, big change and working with the system that we have and seeing if we can make it better. And in regards to food justice, one of the things that has also changed is during COVID, um, it was a horrible time to run a, be declared essential and, and run a business and ask your team to have to defy CDC orders and work in area, you know, uh, environments that were basically as unsafe as can be. So to we as a, as a company just did everything possible to take care of our team. We brought in doctors, we got like contraband masks before they were available, I and mean, it was crazy what we tried to do to keep our team safe, and also everyone has fully subsidized medical, uh, health insurance, and paid time off and sick leave, but then I started thinking about, well, what's going on in our supply chain? And what's going on with the people who are bringing us the food that we're cooking? And I learned that it was a horror story. Um, and we talk about what's going on in um, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. It's a long story, but I was introduced to them. And um, we worked with them for over a year to develop the standards for CPG brands, that is consumer packaged goods. If you buy something at the store that's in a package that's a consumer packaged good, CPG, um, we are the first brand to get a fair food certification on, we're starting with our, our gazpacho. But what does that mean? It means that farmers that we purchase our tomatoes from basically treat their laborers uh, in a manner that you would think would be just basic access to um, water, shade, uh, fair wages, not having your wages stolen, not be sexually assaulted in the field, not, you know, just basic things. And unfortunately, that's not the norm in many of the farms that provide the food that we eat every day. And so my goal as a business owner is to shout this from the rooftops. I'm a tiny fish in a huge pond. But if I can get more and more people to have these conversations that we're having today and understand that the power is in your hands. The power is in your hands. And if we can get more and more people understanding that and making better choices, I do kind of believe <laughs> that things can get better. And if it doesn't, I'll just go back to comedy. <laughs> <laughs> You can, you can, look, you, yeah. Dr. Carter, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> no, I, um, first I want to say that I, I thought your website was hilarious. Oh, so whoever, yeah. like, so yeah. like, literally, I was like, I, I get to the story you, you tell, the way it's formatted. I was like, oh, no, this is, this was really funny. It was very well done. It made me laugh. Thank and you. And so the, the, the comedy chops are still there. I appreciate <laughs> that. I appreciate uh, that. Uh, I think this is where, um, my... My theological background starts to, to pop up that tries to reconcile and work with the pragmatic part of me that understands the reality of our economic system, right? Um, you know, I always tell my students, so University of San Diego has a very big business school. Uh, it's a very wealthy school. And I would have students um, that would talk about, oh, you know, we're a capitalist society, capitalism is the best we can't make. nothing can be better blah 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 <laughs> and i would say well you know like for for i don't know before the idea of capitalism emerged we had this thing called the divine right of kings and if you would have told peasants that at some point 
kings wouldn't actually rule the world and they actually can be able to own land themselves, they would have thought, that's crazy talk, you know? <laughs> like, you know, so I'm like, no, things change and, and that's fine. And, and this is where I think um, re religion can offer us some framework and guideposts for this. Because what I would say is that, you know, um, what we see within the Christian tradition is that, you know, money isn't in and of itself evil, it's what we do with it and how we use it and yeah. the ways in which, like the, 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 the posture with which we think about consumption, right? And so, so much of our consumerist habits are rooted in, can be rooted in a kind of thing wrapped up in the idea of consuming certain goods as a means of performance to make ourselves feel good, Amen. right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not about I ate this food or I got this thing or I'm a vegan so therefore I could feel good in reference in comparison to other people because we're all mired in this complicated Western framework and we're all implicated in so many different things. So we can't stand on our like high horse, so to speak, and then speak in that way. We have to recognize we're all implicated. And so every day is about making choices that lead us toward a more equitable path or an equitable way of being in relationship, not only with farm workers, but with nature, animals and things of that nature. The, la the last thing I, I want to say, and it kind of gets to the no notion of when I, consumerism for me is, is such at the core because I realized at some point that our desire, and so this comes from my reading of St. Augustine, so I'm trying to make it not sound super academic. Um, <laughs> We can have this notion, it's about attachment. And our desire for consumption, we often think it's about just having a lot of stuff. Just getting a lot of stuff, getting a lot of stuff. But it's really not about the acquisition of stuff as much as it is the feeling you get from the pursuit. It's the shopping. It's the pursuit of it. That gives us that feeling, that, that kind of high that we get after we get something. And then after we get the thing, and that high slowly fades, we got to do something else to get our fix, right? And so it's if our if our if we're only attached to our that particular kind of desire, if our desire is rooted in consumption, then our desires are pointed in the wrong place. Our, if our desires are more rooted in pointing oriented towards love and loving our neighbor, that changes what our goals are and what we're pursuing. And like my hope with what you're saying, and the part where I'm gonna channel. Pamela, who, who earlier we talked about and her pessimism with re respect to <laughs> capitalism, <laughs> is like, I don't, especially, I wish I could trust that private sector businesses took seriously the impact of their choices on the community. Oh, you shouldn't. And so, like, and so, like, this is this is the thing. Is like, how do we? And you can talk about how do we incentivize people and those kinds of things that, that that happen. And so, it's almost like for me, it's about finding out and finding out about organizations that I believe are doing things the right way. Mm -hmm. And this kind of again gets us back to this answer. It's, it's you have to do some local research. Mm -hmm. and so, I have restaurants. And now that I've read about your work, I've, we have, we have, we, like, I can buy your products as well. So I can participate in consuming goods by people who are trying to do things the right way. And yes, it takes time. Um, and perhaps maybe one solution is for people like myself who have some time to put together a resource list of people who are doing this to make it easier for those of you who don't have time. That would be great. Um, but like, you know, that, <laughs> that, that for me is where at least I can feel like I'm participating in this system as best as I can and not hurting other people. And so like, I don't want to come across as anti, like, capitalist, right? Um, although I will say, I think I was telling somebody this earlier, I did a sermon on consumerism at my church and afterwards in the receiving line, somebody asked me, am I, they couldn't tell if I'm a socialist or a communist. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, it depends on the day, you know? I don't know, uh, but, but, you know, uh, I, because cuz I'm not I'm really about actually supporting local business people. Like that really actually is, is, is what I get it's about making it, and so I agree local isn't the solution, but for many of us on a practical level, we need to be thinking locally in ways that hopefully can in, and empower other folks who, I would argue people like Dan and other people up here doing the political work to do some of the more structural things. So anyway, I, I so I, it's not that I want to dis disagree with you. It's just that part of me was like, "Ah, oh, man, I really Capitalism has, you know, that, that, that system can, 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 we need to be 
asking ourselves how might we make it better, right? I I I agree. If I can respond. Yeah, no. Oh yeah, no, please. I, I there's so much. I don't even know what you call it when it comes to sustainability and when it comes to justice, food justice in the, in the supply chain. It's greenwashing that's come to mind, yeah. but that's not the right word. You know, it's just so many times you'll see companies post on social, you know, let's celebrate women today in International Women's Month. You'll have women's brands, let's celebrate yeah. women and pay yeah. no attention to the women that are making 10 cents an hour in Bangladesh chained, you know, in to make your pants. That, and so you can celebrate the fancy yogi. It, it, it's, it's absurd. What gives me hope, there are two things. Number one, the TikTok generation. Um, they are exposing, the kids are, they, they are no BS, right? They, they are really trying to get to the root of issues. And so we do, I'm, I'm reading, I have a couple book recommendations, but one I'm, I'm, I'm reading called The Gospel of the Wellness, you know what, now I have to look it up. Uh, by Rena Raphael, it's an amazing book about how we've all been duped into the latest wellness craze, we don't deal with the true issues facing us, and instead we're told it, you know, what, what day is it, it means what phase is it, you know, activated charcoal, collagen, <laughs> kale juice, you know, and it's gonna cure everything. And what we need to do, and what we're counting on the TikTok generation to do is to say, no, what we need to be thinking about, and this is exciting, is that when you make better food choices, when you put thought into your food choices, yeah, you are gonna feel better, not because, the old, the old school, just eat your vegetables, that's what you need to do. You don't need to have collagen. You don't need to have whatever the hot thing is. Eat your vegetables. By the way, if you do that, yeah, you're going to feel a lot better. P.S., if you eat your vegetables and you start thinking about where they're coming from, you're going to make the world a lot better, and that's going to end up working out better for you because mm -hmm. the economy is going to improve because we're going to have more people making more fair wages who are going to spend money that's going to open up doors for opportunity for everyone. So if we can change this wellness conversation from something that's super center, super selfish, what is this mm -hmm. trend going to do for me? And add to it, because you should, you should feel good about what you're eating. I have someone very, very, very close to me who is just, I'm not going to review, I think they're watching online, who was just diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer, which is very, very common for older men. And then if you do a little bit of research, you'll see that eating a ton of vegetables can actually s slow it or stop it. And this person has always ate a lot of fruits and vegetables, is now eating what could only be called an obscene amount, and the numbers are just <laughs> going down, right? So food can make you feel really well. Everyone in my family is on high cholesterol medication. I'm vegan. I'm, once I went vegan, my cholesterol numbers plummeted. I'm not. There are wonderful, selfish reasons to eat vegetables and to eat and celebrate the joy in them, and you're going to feel great, and you're going to look great in your skin, and blah, 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 blah. And, oh my gosh, if you think about it, the world just gets better. And if we can have the TikTok generation have that conversation and say, like, a list would be amazing, get these people, this brand is bullshit. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> and lightning did not strike. We're still pa okay. Pamela uh, talked about porn, so. <laughs> <laughs> not we are gonna move the needle y'all we can do this and we gotta engage the youth Absolutely. but we can do this swearing from the altar i know swearing from the altar it. is like it. a childhood dream it. right <laughs> 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 running away um, derek so talk to me about how you think because you focus so much on faith and food in your work talk to me about how you think that we can manage what i don't know if anybody watched the good place but they, they, I, it, it, it's a show about, there's this one guy and he's an ethicist and he um, did not go to the good place just because he, try, he um, supplemented, he got rid of eating uh, dairy milk and he started eating almond milk. And it was like, oh, but all the resources that go into that. So they, they got into this ethical conversation about the algorithm of unintended consequences. So we're hearing all of these things, and, and now like nobody in this room or nobody online can say that they haven't heard about this, right? Mm. Um, so within the algorithm of unintended consequences, in addition to everything we've heard today, 
do you think that there is a rightful, a place for the church to talk about rightful eating, understanding, as Dr. Carter has said, we're all human. I mean, I think if, if any one of the five of us or six of us on the stage had, you know, our diets put down uh, on a sheet of paper, like it would be like, oh no, somebody saw that I ate Cheetos or something like that, you know? <laughs> so, so that there's rightful eating, but do you, do you think that there is a place for the church in this algorithm of unintended and intended consequences? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wouldn't do what I'm doing if I didn't think so. Um, I think the, the role of the church, though, is to, uh, and this is, this is going to sound vague, and this is going to sound like kind of ephemeral, but the, vague, the job of the church is to move people towards love. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much about giving people a strict diet of here's what's to, what to do. I think there are so many ways that the church can be educating people about these issues and then letting people make decisions that fit in line with what they think is the right way to live their faith out. So for, you know, full disclosure, I eat meat. <gasps> um, and, uh, don't, don't applaud that. No, 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 hey, wait, wait, no. I wasn't going for an applause there. That's the opposite of what I was expecting. Um, but. But ever since I started educating myself on these issues, the way that I eat meat has completely changed. Meat is not the focal point of all of my meals. Meat that I, that I buy, I, I now have done the research of, I get meat delivered to me from uh, farmers who are in the DMV area and you know, who are committed to regenerative mm -hmm. agriculture. And I pay more for that meat. But I'm willing to pay more for that meat. I'm willing to say that my being able to help a person who is committed to trying to do agriculture the right way is an act of love towards that person, towards the animals in that person's care, and towards the earth. And so I think being able to, there, there's the place of education for the church. And I think there's a place of recognizing that scripture speaks on this issue uh, to a tremendous extent. And I think there's being able to give people the grace to say, you have this information, make, dis make the decisions that make sense for where you are, where your family is, but are you moving in the direction of love? I want, well, actually, I want to ask a question. That's what I mean, <laughs> I, I, you know, it's, it's a question for um, as the people who aren't clergy person on this, on this panel. I was just thinking and remembering. I'm taking notes on what you guys, what you all are talking about, and I'm and I have this pervasive sense of spirituality mm -hmm. that you're talking about in different ways. And I'm wondering if if both of you can comment on it in terms of how you or do you see what you're doing? Do you, is there a spiritual dimension? for you in the work that both of you are doing? Because mm -hmm. it, like, again, I'm a religious studies person, so this is my training, so I tend to see that, but I'm curious if you, if you see it at, at all. Mm -hmm. Please, Todd. Jeff. Well, you know, it's interesting you asked me the question, because I thought about it today. I, I, I thought about this panel the last couple of days and how I fit into something like this, you know? Um, but because, um, you know, I, I was raised, I was raised in a Catholic family and, um, so spirituality is big in our family. And uh, my 88-year-old mom still tells me that she, uh, she, you know, and she in church every day and she prays that things continue to go and business continues to grow and so on and so forth. So spirituality has, been a, has always been a big piece of our family. And I, I feel like um, and people that know me and that uh, not just people that I've worked with or people that have I guess I've come in contact or I've gotten to know over the last many years in Washington. Um, I believe that I'm a good person, you know? I think that, I think that believing in, in what you do every day uh, for people that you surround yourself with, whether it, and you know, I, I keep going back to my employees because we in our business, at least for me as a chef, I spend far more time with my employees than I do with my family mm -hmm. and have for decades. And um, so they become your family and, um, and your extended family, if you will. And so 
I've always felt it very important to have some positive human spirituality interaction with them. Um, I, I don't discuss church, so to speak, with my employees, but I care about them to the point where I want to know what they're doing. I want to know how their husband is. I want to know how their children is. I say hello to every one of my employees the minute they walk in the door, and I say goodnight to every one of them before I leave the restaurant every night. And it has served, I think it has served me well because I feel good about what I do every day with regards to people. I mean, we're way off the food subject right now, but um, I mean, you have the responsibility as a chef to, to practice your craft in a responsible fashion. I mean, I, um, whether it's how much meat you eat or cook or consume, I'm not sure that, I mean, I'm still sell meat. I make money on it. It pays my mortgage. It is what it is. So do vegetables. So it is, <laughs> it is what it is. But, but, um, so I, I think when we talk about spirituality, I feel like I get the opportunity to, to have spiritual interaction with my staff every day. And, and, and I think a lot of it too is, I don't know if the words, and I, I think sincerity also comes into play. I mean, how sincere are you when you look another human being in the eye yep. and really ask them how they're doing? Mm -hmm. yep. And do you really care? Yep. And I mean, there's, t I, I think, mm -hmm. I think there's times, I'm not very good at it, but I think there's times when I am so consumed or there's things that are going on in my life that if I'm not, <clears throat> I would rather not engage with you just to try to BS through the whole conversation to make you think that we're, that I'm, it, I take my time to myself maybe for a couple of hours and they say, oh, something's happening or he's got a lot going on or he's upset about something or, and then I come back into the game. But that doesn't happen very often. I don't, I don't, I am a very unusual operator. I am a very calm, very peaceful chef. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I come out of my clogs once or twice a year. <laughs> <laughs> but not on a regular basis. I don't think it's very healthy. But um, so I think spirituality comes into play. I hope I'm answering the question. But I think I, 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 I think that spirituality comes into play um, with your with man with your fellow mankind and the people that whether you are close to them or not. And um, I'm a people person. You know, that's what you get in our work. And if you're not a people person, you become sort of alienated and isolated. And um, I mean, you're nothing without family, and you're certainly you're nothing without the people that are close to you, helping you every day to, whether it's see your vision, be part of your vision, or just to get through your day feeling good about what you're doing, I think, for me, um, and what I'm doing for them. But I, I think so, spirituality, I think it has to be part of your daily existence in first show, at least for me it is. Yeah, yeah. No? Um, that's eating at the brunch is a spiritual experience for me. Just, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, I just did it three weeks ago. Yeah, I love it. It's, well, Sarah, I'd also love to talk for you to talk about the, the kosher certification yeah, yeah, of that's, your soups. Too. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'm, I am a person of faith. I'm, I'm Jewish, so I have a PhD in guilt. It's a run off between y'all and the Catholics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's actually, it's actually yes. close. <laughs> Very close. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that people of faith, um, first of all, we, I think, you know, people pay so much money to try to become mindful. They download apps, they go to, to, to weekend retreats. And I think a lot of people of faith, we're like, every time we sit down to a meal, y'all, we, we say grace, right? And, and, um, our prayers actually, they reference where the food comes from. Uh, so, well, like if you're making a blessing over wine, it says thank you for the, the fruit of the vine, um, for example. So we really have this deep connection to where our food comes from, and we are forced, all of us, to pause and, and, and be grateful, right? And, and if you get to sit down to a meal, gratitude, right? Um, and so I think that's a beautiful thing when it comes to our, all of our faiths here. Um, and we do have a kosher certification, the rules of... Uh, kashrut, as we call them, are really, really strange. Um, in the Bible, they're very strange, but they are, um, in my opinion, if you really go to the spirituality behind them, they're absolutely beautiful. And it, 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 you have to think about where your food comes from and 
um, are you respecting the land and are you respecting the animal and are you respecting how it's uh, slaughtered? I hate the term processed. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the processing of chickens and the processing, no, it's slaughtering. And, um, and so when we decided to get a kosher certification, it wasn't just to, it's a, it's a business decision. It's very hard, the, but um, it also was, I wanted really our team and our company to connect with our food in a very basic level. And so that comes directly from my faith. So thank you for asking that. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I do, yeah, no, 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 you're amazing. I, I can't wait to hear you preach tomorrow morning. Um, it's going to be asking a lot of questions. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> questions from the audience. Um, I, and, I, and I think that goes back to what you were talking about, that we do create the food system yes. every single day. Yes. None of this happens just by magic. I mean, every single day that you buy something, and one of the things that I'll just plug for you, Sarah, that um, her soups are going to be available in Giant. Soon, Very soon, yes. Which is a really, which is a really big deal, I think, for yeah. access for people who don't, who would go to a giant yes. rather than a specialty grocery store. Mm -hmm. um, but let's talk a little bit about sourcing too, mm. because um, Sarah, you are a woman-owned business. Um, Todd, you. Uh, <laughs> You deal with sourcing all the time on very small margins, as the restaurant industry is known to have. But you also have to, um, you tell the stories of those, and that, that contributes to the pleasure. I mean, that's not to plug my book, but that's a lot of like the science in the book is about how the stories actually enhance the pleasure that food brings to you. And pleasure is a form of human nourishment. Um, particularly around food, uh, the rituals around it, that kind of thing. So can you talk to me, particularly, you know, everyone, most people are on a budget. Um, and the um, number of people who are on a budget <laughs> gets bigger every year. And so how do you look at spending more on ingredients, spending more on um, meat that is human, humanely raised, that kind of thing. How do you look at that in terms of your bottom line when you're trying to run a business? And Derek and Dr. Carter, how do you think about talking to other people about that when really people are living on shoestrings? And whoever wants to take that first, go ahead, because it's a really hard question. Chef, you want to see the gander? <laughs> <laughs> well, I... Hmm. Well, I, I think when you talk about sourcing, and there's no doubt cost of goods have, have, uh, have gone way up. I, um, I mean, I, unfortunately, you know, pricing on menus has had to go up. You, you know, you have, I mean, you have to make the numbers work. Uh, you know, we, the frightening thing is, is that uh, local spinach, or I mean, it, it, vegetables are more expensive than meat and fish. Per when pound, did that happen? Per yeah. pound. What, is, that, is that a recent phenomenon? Well, you have to think about, so uh, if you look at, and I say a seasonal mushroom, like a chanterelle mushroom, you know, which can be 18 or $19 a pound. So you pay $19 a pound for a pound of mushrooms. But you'll pay, depending on where you're buying it, your chicken, you could pay anywhere from three ninety-five to five ninety-five a pound. Um, high-grade beef tenderloin is going to cost you $17, $18 a pound. It is what it is. So you can say, well, the mushrooms are more expensive than beef. And um, I was just looking at some, some, some bid sheets from some local farmers, and I was looking at the cost of ramps because we were trying to bring ramps to seasons come in. You know, ramps are $32 a pound right now. So now, so if you say $32 for a pound, now a pound of ramps is an awful lot of ramps. Now, I mean, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't say, well, the, well, honey, tell you what, you know, let's, let's eat the pound of ramps for dinner as opposed to having two chicken breasts, you know, but, but, but because you wouldn't do that. But you're always, you're, you're, you're trying to fray costs depending on what your menu detail and menu style is. Um, I don't think when everybody always says to me, boy, that vegan menu must, or that plant-based menu, boy, you must make great money on that. <laughs> you always, you know, you just never, I don't really engage in that kind of conversation very often, but, um, you know, sourcing from good producers of sustainable product, whether it's, 
I have a great farm in Virginia. I get this Wagyu beef from out in Virginia, Vaca Farm. She's a wonderful lady. She's a, a woman-run business. And, you know, I, you find the products sometimes you can afford to buy from them, and you buy a, a lot of it all the time because you find we do sous vide with it. You take the tri-tip and we sous vide it. It's already $20 a pound, but it's not $40 a pound like a beef tenderloin, and it works. And, you know, it's um, unfortunately when you go into a, a restaurant that's got stemware and tablecloths and linen from France and you order the special of beef, I mean, it's going to be $60. It is what it is. And then if you don't want to spend $60, you can spend $30 on something. So you, you try to do your best to, to hold back. Um, I've been always very price conscious on the menu to try to hold things down as much as you can. But um, I think, like you were saying, you know, buying like I'm sure the beef you're talking probably is a good grass-fed beef or whatever it is. Um, um, so I would rather um, I would rather not use the product just based on price point. You could say, well, it's cheaper to get this type of of ground beef, but you don't know where I mean, what it all it is of how many steroids the animals probably had injected. And so you'd say, well, we just don't do ground beef. I mean, we just don't. And I don't. You know, we don't, we only serve, we don't serve that much uh, meat in the restaurant at all. It's, my menu is 50% plant-based. So, um, but we're mixed, so, you know, yeah, it's nice because we have a blended menu for people that some eat meat, some eat fish, half are vegan, so it's a good, it's a good formula for us. Um, well, I'm trying to get to the answer to your question, but um, there's no doubt that cost of goods is challenging. As you, I, I think, you know, when you see invoices come in, and I mean, you know, our, our equation, and it is, uh, it's, but you see something that you've spent $100 on, you've got to do the quick math, and you say, how are we going to get $350 or $400 out of this product? And that's what it, that's our, that's how we survive as a restaurant. Rent, all that water, all that real estate, all of the pass-throughs, all of the cams, the whole deal, when you say, well, you know, that's, you got to triple to quadruple your purchases to make the number, to hit that nut. So, you know, you look at those things and you say, well, how can we, you know, how can we blend our menus so that it's not offensive price point wise? Um, we'd rather not make certain margins on certain other things, but that's why the pasta is always good for us, right? So, <laughs> so, so, well, it's true. I mean, if they you know flour's enough, but eggs aren't cheap anymore, but egg yolks and flour and water uh, with those chanterelle mushrooms that are $32 a pound, and you start doing some food costs, hey, you know, that's why there's so many wonderful Italian restaurants in this world, because they're, <laughs> and pizzerias are smart, you know? So why is it more important than, and this is for anybody, why is it more important to actually buy from women owned businesses or businesses that are owned by people of color, indigenous people, rather than just post a square on Instagram? Okay, let me finish this one then, okay, because sorry. I was got, no, no, I'm glad because you're bringing it back. You know, um, it, 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 it kind of takes me back to when I was getting asked early on when we started this in the late 90s and early 2000s, when we were supporting all these local people and we were going out to Virginia and we were growing our own cattle and we were trying to learn how to feed a cow and how could it be a better thing for us and it was the right thing to do. Um, and someone said, yeah, well, is it better to have organic? Was it, is it organic or is it local? And I've always been a big you know, supporter of local because really, is it better? I mean, we're on a lot of organic farms on this part of the country now, but was, is it better to think, well, I'd rather eat organic, so you, you're going to pay for carrots that are jetted across the United States exactly. and the jet fuel so you can eat organic. Better to, to, to support a young man and his family and his children who drive their trucks up from southern Virginia that they can't afford to have this soil organic, but they are sustainably, they are, they're responsible growers. And so we find that local is better. And I would, like you say, so, so is it better to support these small farmers or, or, or people of the inner city that are doing things like on rooftop acres and people that are growing things that are employing children of the inner city that help to keep these gardens going and everything? I mean, what's not, what's not right about that? Of course, yes. that's the right thing to do. Of course, that's the full circle. And 
So that is very important that you, we support our local commerce and our local people and, and the local job. Market. Yeah, and that's also a national security issue, too, is that if we don't have food around our urban areas, and there's anything that happens outside of the urban areas and you can't get food into there, what is it? Um, you, won't, you won't have anything to eat in your, in your cities. And cities are, as we know, on the rise and growing. Um, Sarah, do you want to answer anything about women-owned businesses? But I, I definitely want to get to like a practical sort of like, what is one thing we can all do? OK. Yeah, let's keep Because we're running out of time. I mean, I oh. can't, I can't, no, I mean, I can't, it's gone by very quickly for me. I don't know about anybody else. But um, I would love for all of you to say one thing that people can do tonight and one thing that they can do next week. So one thing that is immediately actionable, and then one thing that maybe takes a little more effort, like, oh, if you're at the grocery store, do this, or if you go to a farmer's market, or whatever it is. One thing people can do tonight, one thing they can do next week, that can lit help us live as people who eat in a way that lives up to our ideas and values as people of faith of whatever faith i mean even if you're not a religious person there you, you you have a belief in humanity right so um i don't know who wants to start with that but um i would love to hear from all of you and i'll be taking notes too so i, I can start um i mean that's like basically i wrote, wrote a book about so um <laughs> you know and i can't help but i have to say a couple other things i know we're running out of time so i apologize but i just wanted to say that Chef Todd, I think what you have created, what you describe as your restaurant, uh, is as much of what church is supposed to be. Mm. Mm. And I don't know that you thought about that, but you have created a place where people feel like they belong. It's true. And it that is. That yes. is what church is at its best. That is very sacred. Okay. That is a, that is amazing. Just Hallelujah, Escoffier. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I, I was like, wow. I was like, oh, wow, this is, this, this is church. Um, and what I, what I heard so much you saying, um, Sarah, was like about the importance of relationship. And it's not, honestly, it's not so much surprising because you started this with your mother. Mm -hmm. um, but relationship at its core is key to the way in which you think about what not only is sustainable, but what's transformational. And those are kind of the things that I took away from, from what both of y'all have said. And I, I just wanted to thank you um, for naming that and for people being in the, in the field um, in, in a space where you have to do it in a, in a way to make money, you know, and yet you're, ta you're, you're taking it and trying to do it in a way that is um, rightful, to use the language around here. And that, for me, I find inspiring. With respect to things I think people can do, um, I would encourage everybody today to write down, so one of the questions I always ask is, you know, how do we eat in ways that are in alignment with our moral and social values? The only way you can answer that question is, the only way you can answer that is literally to answer it. Like, write down what your values are, <laughs> like write them down. Like what are the values that you actually espouse, right? Are you a person who espouses nonviolence? Are you a person who justice is a virtue for you? Is love, compassion, whatever it is, write it down. And then ask yourself, how might I eat in ways that actually live up to what I wrote down? Knowing, as we said, there, there is going to be a gap, and that is okay, because now that you've written it down, you have an aspirational list for you to grow towards. Mm -hmm. But at first, you have to name it, and sometimes the fear we have is actually naming it, because then we have something to hold ourselves accountable to, right? So I invite you to do that tonight in terms of one actionable item. Um, the second thing you can do over the course, I would say, of the week is to try to identify like a actual, whether it's a local business that is, you know, to, and this is where I, I do want to get to thinking about buying stuff from cooperatives and supporting those kinds of local organizations, which is where I get most of my food and produce from, um, to try, and I, and I say this, I should say, let me finish my thought, to, to purchase as much as you can from those places that are where the dollar stays within the community. You asked the question about how do we do this in a way that's um, economically sustainable. I feel like some of this is up to people like myself who, and I am a very, I have flipped the script from growing up super, super poor to now having a, a partner, because the Lord knows it's not me, who makes a bunch of money. 
So like, and so I'm in a different financial position. Those and, and, chihuahuas and, outside I know, of exactly, I know, exactly. You know, so like, so, so we are in a very, very good financial um, position. And so I recognize that this is economically hard. But part of the reason the chef is talking about the margins so thin is because that we put so much subsidies in our, in meat. Like we artificially deflate the cost of meat. We don't pay the true cost. Yeah. And if we worked to allow us to pay the true cost, that would equalize things, right? Um, so some of that, that activism is up to people like me and the people on the previous panel to advocate to make some of those changes to get more price equity. Um, and and supporting, supporting organizations that do that work is something you can think about doing long term. So I'll give you something to do tonight, in the week, and down the road. So there you go. Did Amazing. extra bonus. Yeah, so. thank you. I'm also going to give three things. Okay. Yeah. We're here to talk about food justice, right? And, and I think... Um, if you look at how the, our food is grown, the person who's picking the food, how it's transported, how it gets on the shelf, basically none of that journey is just. Yep. None of it right now. So um, the first thing you could do tonight, I, we talked about it on the call, um, John Oliver did an incredible piece on the Fair Food Program on the Coalition of Immokalee work Workers. Last Google week. it. Yep. Last week. Last week? Was it already last week? Okay. Um, Google it. Watch it. it he, he will educate you way better than any of us could because he's John Oliver. <laughs> he is a lucrative. That is how comedy can be lucrative. Yep. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you found the way. <laughs> so I should email that man. Anyway, um, watch that video tonight. Oh, God. Step two is... Um, Go to the store and, and purchase maybe, you don't need to purchase, we all have phones. If you're seeing two products side by side and one is more expensive, maybe look at why. Don't always go for the cheapest item because there is no free lunch. And if something is suspicio suspiciously inexpensive, there is a reason and someone is getting exploited in that, in that journey that bring it to the shelf. So, investigate why is this product why is the supergirl soup a little bit more money so and then buy and then buy our soup <laughs> you can take and then number three i i mean i have to, i'm a business woman. number three is um have have these conversations i encourage you um to have sunday supper i always tell my friends at sabbath dinner shabbat dinner on friday night have these conversations because the way we continue to make change is by having these conversations and so you might have lunch with friends who then have a dinner with friends who then go to a, a maybe set up something like this in their church or their synagogue and that is how organic change happens and um so there's there's three pieces of homework for you thank you yeah thank sure. you in terms of what you can do right now um, aside from buying her soup or going to Equinox, um, which I think would be good things to do. Or um, pre-ordering your book, I'm or, just <laughs> well, well, What's the title uh, of your book again, to pre-order? The Just Kitchen. Um, <laughs> it's anywhere you buy books. Um, <laughs> so a couple things. Um, for, and this is for those of us who call ourselves Christians, who call ourselves mm. followers of Jesus Christ. And this might not be a one night project, so it's maybe not just tonight. But even just going off the top of your head, go through the scripture and circle all of the places that talk about food. Mm. And, and, and look at what those connections to food say to who we're supposed to be in relationship to our neighbor, who we're supposed to be in relationship to the land, who we're supposed to be in relationship to God. That's a lot of work. Um, however, for some of you, it will feel like less work than the second thing I'm going to say, which is plant a garden. Mm. Because I don't always know where my, you know, I have to do some research into where my meat comes from. But in a week, I'm going to know exactly where my lettuce comes from. Mm -hmm. And in a couple months, I'm going to know exactly where my potatoes come from. And if you are limited in space, grow herbs. If you are, there's a lot of things that you can grow in very small containers. You can get 
little tiny tomato plants. You can get little tiny peas. You can grow, also grow flowers because they're pretty. Yeah. And joy is also, has been mentioned, an yeah. important part of this. But plant a garden. And, and for the love of God, get it out of your head that you don't have a green thumb. If there's so many people, well, Derek, I don't have a green thumb. Green thumb is not a thing. <laughs> Find something that you enjoy eating and grow it. You will have more incentive to grow it well if it's something you enjoy. So find food in the scripture, plant a garden. Thank you. Todd. Well, these are tough ones. Myth me for the follow-up on all those three stars uh, suggestions. Well, I have one that it's probably a lot of this stuff is based on sort of being a responsible consumer. First thing I would say maybe you can do tonight is take the water bottle that's in your hand or it's in the console of your car and try to get it till Tuesday night without throwing it away. Yeah. Try to get the water bottle. If you have any disposable water bottles that you typically carry around with you or you have in the console of your car, try to reuse it for the next 72 hours and see if you can do that. Mm. That would be a first sign of responsible consumption and being thinking of our environment. And the other one, I'm just thriving this from food stuff. I, mean, I would say, because my wife loves to give me a, a business on this, go try to cook down your refrigerator. Mm -hmm. okay. You'd that. probably be amazed how many meals that you have in your cupboard and in your refrigerator before you head to the supermarket mm. and spend money on things that are probably very overpriced like we all were just talking about. But I think that's a good challenge to... to uh, to work with the things that you have in your home and to cook what you have and uh, and the next time you do go to the store what you buy see if you can really cook all of it mm -hmm. we always have a half an onion two carrots left half a bag of carrots <laughs> the half of the zucchini half a can of crushed the tomatoes you hail yeah you <clears throat> and you I'm use what this. actually cook what you bought actually use everything that you buy and it will make you probably think that when you think you need a whole bunch of celery, you probably don't. You probably need to look in your fridge. And you, I, I've learned that recently. I just, I don't know why. I just, I think as we get older, we get a little bit more, I don't know, we want to use everything we have. So hope those are useful. That's great. 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 Yeah. Great. great. Those are fantastic. And I do have to say locally grown celery is a revelation. Yes. If you haven't gone to a farmer's market <laughs> and just bought celery, actually Pam Hess gave me a, she, she made this like, little salad it was like <laughs> celery shaved celery and fennel and lemon juice and whatever and yeah this was like 10 years ago she told me about this but um well thank you everybody for being here um i have been to a lot of food conferences and this is as good if not better than every one that i've been to this we've had a really all-star panel and great ideas throw it around and also great practical ideas to bring it home. So I do want to um, thank St. Albans uh, for putting this together. And um, I guess I'll hand it over to Dr. Carter or Amanda to give closing remarks, I'm not sure. Or Emily, Emily's coming up. Do traveling music. <laughs> All right, so I have been invited to ask Reverend Dr. Carter um, if you have any sort of closing thoughts or words for us um, as we prepare to leave this place. Yes. I was just sharing resources, sorry. Yes. There we go. I will let you take a picture. Yes, Man. thank you. I'm like, oh, you should get this book. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Taking a picture. Actually, I'll stand right here because you can hear me uh, from the microphone, I think. Or right, over here. All right. All right. Oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Um, I want to thank you all for, uh, in, again, inviting me uh, to be here. This was an amazing opportunity. Um, you know, there was a, a person who went to pray. I, think, I can't quite remember her name. I think it was, oh, she went to pray at the cathedral. But then um, I guess they're doing some work in there. And they told her she could come here and pray. And then that's when she found, she found out about this panel. And she is Kenyan, uh, doing work on... Um, health and wellness from a public health perspective and just happened to be, you know, learning about my research and my writing and bought the book and had an amazing conversation with her. And it just reminded me of the ways in which God continues to work and move and connect, right? And, and as my friends in the UCC church would say, like, God is still speaking. And I think that is 
so powerful to remember to be open to that um, ways in which God is moving. And I feel as though this conference, as you're describing, has been one of those moments where there's been a lot of energy, a lot of collective energy. Um, I hope that you all feel inspired and empowered to go back and to actually do some of the things we've been talking about, that you have a lot to think about, um, and that, that it begins to um, permeate within you. If I could simply ask um, that if you have, um, if you did purchase the book, my book, and you happen to like it, um, if you are an Amazon person, leave a little review, that'd be great, because all those things help, um, or on, on uh, good, good reads, all that stuff helps, um, in part because, you know, my goal is to, so many of the religious dietary literature comes from a very conservative perspective, if you didn't know. It's about, it's very transactional. Oh, eat this way, it's the Daniel fast, blah, blah, blah. And it's all about how it makes you look. And I'm really trying to help us think theologically about this from a broader perspective. Um, and I've been excited to share that, this journey with you. And thank you for inviting me on your own journey. Um, if you don't mind, I just want to say a brief prayer to wrap us up. To, but you do it. Go. Oh, thank you. Yes. I invite you to bow your head. God of hope. God of joy and wonder. We thank you for the way in which you continue to reveal yourself to us. We thank you for the love of your son that permeates this space. We thank you for your spirit that invigorates us and inspires us. And we ask that as we go out into the world, we ask that as we leave this building, that you will continue to guide our feet, that you would show us the path we are to follow so that we may live into this call of the beloved community, that we may open our tables to feed those who are hungry, to give water to those who are thirsty, to be the change that we want to see in the world. Lord, give us the strength. We ask these things in the name of your son, and let everybody say, amen. amen. Thank you so much. And if you liked that glimpse into the preacher, come back tomorrow. <laughs> um, the Reverend Dr. Christopher Carter will be preaching at our 9 o'clock and 11.15 English services right here. So that all being said, thank you for all of you for the time and the energy that you have dedicated to this. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you above all to our Memorial Lecture Committee who put this all together for us. Go and eat rightfully and go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. I'll wait around. Yeah.